Hey, hey. Welcome to the show, everybody. My name is Joe Rad. This is the PlayStation Collectors Podcast. Uh, we're missing Figsy Games tonight. He's feeling a little under the weather uh, in Australia there. So uh, it's just going to be the two of us. But that's all right. We got a great show tonight. Uh, tonight, joining us, we have RNG Gamer. What's going on, man? Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. I am extremely excited for this episode. Um, been watching your stuff for a little while um if anybody hasn't checked out this guy's channel uh you should immediately he has an insane collection of games um spans i mean you're talking all the way from the intellivision up into modern gaming uh you got everything man and uh quite impressive and wonderful taste i might say like um a lot of times i watch people's collections and i'm like oh that's cool but like when you were showing yours i was just like drooling over all your stuff man it's not only do you have like multiple collections of different systems you have like such choice stuff i just gotta say like fantastic really well, thank you so much yeah I, I i even collect for the first generation so all the way back to the pong consoles and stuff all the way up to the ps5 but i do have a a strong interest and in a, a draw towards the more esoteric and kind of mm -hmm. off the beaten path sort of games yeah which i, I can relate to that like if you're into the hobby for a long time it's like you end up just exploring like more like the hidden corners of the libraries of systems and the wackier things that you know you never really realized came out and like once you get deep into collecting it's like i think we talked about this when mort was on too like you almost start to get beyond just games like you start looking at peripherals and weird consoles and and like stuff that came out in japan that we never got over here and stuff like that so yeah yeah i got a lot of that i i collect like the msx computer and the nuance and all kinds of weird stuff but yeah That's it's sick. it's uh you get more and more and more hardcore about it over the years as you you start hunting and you develop mm. a taste for that sort of thing i guess <laughs> well i appreciate it and um i was you know watching your game room tour and, and it was funny you got your like a little television section you're like nobody cares about this stuff but here it is and i'm like i care i love <laughs> atari i love a television I like Vectrex. I like all that old stuff. So you mentioned like, the Vectrex. You know, I have a complete Vectrex set, right? I did see that, and uh, it is gorgeous. Not only do you have the complete set, you actually have the 3D setup, like the headset, the accessories, right? For it I too. do. I have the I have the 3D headset and all of the the wheels you need to make the 3D work on the games, and I have the light pen that lets you draw on the monitor. Does it feel like you're living in 2007 when you wear that thing? <laughs> It does. <laughs> yeah, in it's the, like in the wave of the future, future right? In the past, I don't know. <laughs> That's cool though. It, there's just something charming about the old wireframe games. So they're very yeah, cool. I love that vector look. It's there's nothing quite like it. And uh, a Vectrex mm -hmm. like console humming in the dark when you turn it on is really, really a nice sound. Like you're tethered mm -hmm. to it. You're sitting right up with your face in front of it, like you're supposed to. You can feel the radiation hitting your eyes it's everything you've ever wanted <laughs> you feel the radiation exactly you feel your grandmother telling you i'll sit so close to that thing i know you right burn your eyes out <laughs> like exactly well uh yeah i i have a 
an appreciation for that stuff. I feel like there's like definitely like an age cutoff for people who will c- can go back and enjoy Atari and stuff like that. And like, that's it's true. Not- Although I do see some younger people. I've had people approach me that are, you know, 10 or 11, 12 years old, and they like that old stuff. They enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's more of a novelty to them rather than a nostalgia trip, of course, but games were fun no matter when they came out, right? People are used to pay- playing these free mobile games that are like Flappy Bird. You're just tapping a button. Mm-hmm. Well, the Atari is just that all the time, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so exactly. there's still fun to be had there if you can get over the stigma of playing like a just an old game that doesn't look great. Yeah, and um, it's so I actually still think that the Atari is a great system for like very young kids because for a very young kid, they don't need some obviously deep, complicated experience. They and and and, and like I felt like I was lucky that I got to start off like learning games when games had one button and a joystick. And that's where I got to start, like nice and simple. Like, and then, then I got to move on to the, the, you know, the two button systems and then the four button. And I got to like naturally progress as games got more complicated. So I think that's a nice place to start little kids too. Same thing. There's there's definitely a lot to say for that. The problem is though, the games are so flipping hard. (laughs) That's true. Like Atari games are really tough. So, but my little girl, my oldest girl, when she was like three and four, started wanting to play games and she played some, she had some weird stuff. She played some original Super Mario Brothers. She really liked mm-hmm. Kaboom on the 2600, which yeah, is a paddle awesome. controller game. And she was really into playing R Type. Like I had a, wow. Well, I do have a MAME arcade machine, but she Wait, loved where is it. Right there. That's my R Type poster, right? Yeah. <laughs> Big fan. Cool. So kids have interesting taste. Of course, now that she hangs out with her friends, she just wants to play Minecraft all the time. So mm. as much as we try, it's hard to to steer them away from what their friends want them to do. Yeah, so that's a huge thing nowadays. It's uh, everybody kind of plays the same game. And I mean, there was some sort of that going on when I was younger with like uh, Call of Duty and, you know, people would be moving on to certain fighting games and stuff like that. But not like now where it's just never ends like back then you know yeah everybody's just playing minecraft and fortnite and roblox that's mm-hmm. pretty much it because they're free you can play them on any device right the mom just hands the kid a tablet the kid downloads what he's or she has heard her friends talk about and they get into it so they want to do what their friends are doing and all their friends are doing the same thing and you get a constant feed of people on youtube telling you how cool it is so My daughter, when she plays Minecraft, she just treats it like Legos. So she just wants Mm -hmm. to like build. I don't think she's ever beaten Minecraft. We've tried together, but she's just like, let's make a garden. So we make a garden. Doesn't want him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my my girlfriend. Um, we 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 joke about it all the time. Like we both like cozy games, but like Mm -hmm. I I kind of like can't play ones that have no combat at all. Like when it's just farming or just growing crops or just I'm like, I, I just can't. I need to have to like some I have to bop something on the head with the hammer or something. I can't just like I has to have some sort of action combat. And she's the complete opposite. She's like, nope. Like she watched me play Final Fantasy seven rebirth. And she's like, this game's so cute and it's so pretty and I love it. But I just don't want to fight anything. So if I could I play it. with with no combat, I would have I would love it. She's just like, I just want to collect all those pretty birds you're riding. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it. I get yeah. it. I get it. Mm-hmm. I get it. My wife's the same way. She likes games that are more thought provoking. So she likes things like Slay the Spire and mm, stuff game. she has to, to put a little thought into. She doesn't like things that require a lot of coordination. So um, it's sometimes hard for us to find games to play together. We played uh, It Takes Two and yeah, she did not one. have a good time. No. With that. Okay. She did not. It was a. Uh, she doesn't like 3D platformers. You forget how many buttons are on a modern controller. It's like 14. Mm-hmm. So the idea of like sprinting down a hill and like double jumping and then like grabbing on with your hook shot to something and swinging and then jumping off that onto another platform. I mean, we're, we're like, okay, that's simple. You just hold like the right trigger and then you press X twice and then you press the right R1. Like what else would the grappling hook be, right? Of course it's R1. She would mm-hmm. just hit every button on the controller. She would like flip and uh the button on the PlayStation 4 controller that like takes screenshots, she would like hit that. <laughs> and, like mm-hmm. 
hit the uh the touchpad, things like that. It was it was crazy. Yeah, and then you run into a problem with those games too, where like if there's a skill gap, like you're probably pretty good at games, I'm assuming. So like I said, I was what you have a series of videos about hard bosses. So I'm assuming you enjoy hard games. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm I, I feel like I'm not great, but I mm -hmm. I'm probably decent enough i uh, yeah, i've made exactly it on the leaderboards worldwide of a few different games and i've one mm -hmm. credit cleared a lot of shoot 'em ups and yep. there are gaps in my ability i'm not a great fighting game player but mm -hmm. i would certainly like waste someone that was not used to playing fighting games at all you know if all you do is play fighting games i don't have a chance but mm -hmm. Yeah, I so when like people always say Fortnite like, player, they're going down real hard. <laughs> yeah, when people say like, "Are you good?" I'm like, compared to, <laughs> like, I play shmups. I'm like, compared to people who don't play these games, I'm very good. Yeah, compared to people who are like really good at these games, I'm not good at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I can I can hang and I can enjoy yeah. them, and that's not the point. It's not it doesn't really matter in my opinion. That whether or not you can like one you know beat everything it's just like if you enjoy hard games you just enjoy them like it doesn't even winnings so you should like if you enjoy hard games you know that it's not even about winning sometimes it's about just the challenge and overcoming it and like persevering and the discipline of it mm -hmm. um, not giving up and then uh eventually dedication you should win you know not always there are some things that you just they're just too hard and if it is so one thing i i wanted to bring up i saw on your channel is you seem to you like shoot them ups you like shmups a lot Mm -hmm. and there are i love shmups and there are some that are just <laughs> laughably difficult i call them where i'm like i just haha, i'm not even nah <laughs> i'm not oh, even oh, yeah, gonna for sure. try for like, sure a lot the of the cave, of effort. cave shoot em ups are, are mm. like that borderline impossible right correct and oh. then uh what usually happens with those games too is i don't know about you but like i you play them for me, it takes me like, you know, 100 attempts, 200 attempts sometimes, depending on the game. To, and then like you'll have a run where you don't even realize how good you're doing. Like you're just like spacing out, thinking about other stuff. And then all of a sudden you realize you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm like one CC and I'm on the last level. Oh, geez. And then all of a sudden the heart palpitation. Oh, yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. It's just like as soon as you realize how close it is like that's it. I, um, I can't tell you how many shmups like i've cleared to the last boss for the one cc and got the last boss to like 10 percent health and not sealed the deal like there i have like at least half a dozen games like that that i'm so close to the one cc but i just yeah the, that the adrenaline overwhelms me, me that happens to me quite often too the mushihime sama futari uh i had like a log a journal where i tracked my progress on like every phase of every boss and Dude, I knew going into the last stage mm. that I had to have four lives and at least three bombs on the current life I was on to have mm -hmm. like a 10% chance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, I'll bomb here, I'll bomb here, I'll bomb here. And then my goal was to get to the last boss, survive like the first wave, bomb, and then just bomb it out. <laughs> just die and bomb it out. Mm -hmm. And when I finally got to where I had like five lives and four bombs, I was up a life and I just panicked. Mm -hmm. I panicked all the way through the fifth stage. And when I got to her, I was well below what I needed to succeed. And I managed to just pull it out. I probably had like a 5% chance, but I went back after that and tried to one CC it again. Mm -hmm. And I never was able to get back to the last boss. It was like a one time deal. <laughs> oh, I bet that's, um, one of the biggest problems with those games is it's like not only is the last boss insane, but like just getting to him to be able to practice is insane. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the last most shmups, like the let's say they're five or six levels. The first four levels are just a warm up. They're mm -hmm. they're just literally like they're just a warm up. And then you get to that last level and that's when the game really starts. I feel like all the bullet speed goes and the patterns get crazier and the, the designer starts throwing some evil thing in at the end that it's just, yeah. And so then, and then you finally get there. And then what's really cute is the ones where you finally do it and you beat the boss and they're like, but wait, 
Yeah, true last the boss. True you boss. <laughs> and you're like, come on. And it's even more. It's like the most absurd thing you've ever seen in your life. And, and you're the, like, what? How am I supposed to practice is, this? It's usually getting to the true last boss involves doing the one CC. And since this is your yeah. first time ever doing it, you had no practice with this boss. Yeah. No it, practice. It's a, it's a, um, definitely a type of game design that is just an, an old arcade uh, feel to it they just don't really do that anymore i guess they I don't, don't. well there are a lot of like new shoot 'em ups coming out that are pretty good um that were never arcade games and mm -hmm. i do like that they've sort of worked that out you know that it's not mm -hmm. about like feeding quarters into the system the goal isn't to get your money the goal is to like actually let you have a good time now so games like mm -hmm. zero ranger mm -hmm. things like that are really good uh crimson clover they're like That's arcade games, but they're not designed to to be too brutal. Just, Crimson Cl just, Clover is like my one of my favorite games like of all yeah. time. Absolutely love it. Um, didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, sorry. No, you're um, fine. You're fine. But yeah, you, I would say that's true. Like, so cave games are they're for like the purists. I'd say, like they don't give you like a lot of not like. Well, I guess the new ones. The new Dodonpachi game does, but you don't get like a lot of hypers usually and bullet clears and stuff. You just get some bombs, a one up, a couple, I mean, you know, a couple extras, yeah. and that's about it. But like you said, there's like the newer um, games that are like they're trying to figure out ways to get more people into the, the into the genre, and they're like giving you like more bullet clears and shields and you just bullet absorbs and reflects and little gimmicky things to try to like make it a little easier yeah uh, i mean every shoot em up has to kind of like have some sort of gimmick and mm -hmm. cave does rely a lot on like bullet canceling like if you kill the big enemy on the screen it like turns all the bullets into like a score score multiplier and mm -hmm. a lot of it's about stringing those together and i think that's what people like about them but if you don't have that concept in your head then you're never going to be able to succeed. That's what makes those games so hard for like the casual audience. Cause they just see this wall of bullets and they're like, I'll never be able to dodge that. I'm like, dude, you don't have to dodge it, man. You just got to get in there and like kill the giant mm -hmm. slug that's over on the side of the screen and it will cancel exactly. all those bullets. Right. So I think that that's a deterrent a lot of the time for people that aren't really versed in what it's like to play an arcade game or a, a shoot em up, especially not like a cave game or a rising game or something like that. But, um, I am glad to see that the genre is making a comeback and that mm -hmm. there are some like indie developers out there putting out really good stuff. They grew up playing the kind of games that we like. So mm -hmm. I think yeah, that's some of the cool ones. Yeah. Um, I liked um, some of the newer ones I liked. I like Crisis Wing. I don't know if you tried that one. That one's I have like Crisis it. Wing. It's sitting right over here on the shelf. I have not cracked it open or given it a shot yet. It hasn't gotten picked for me to play. <laughs> It's it's um oh yeah you, well we can go into that in a minute but yeah but that one's like it's like a Genesis kind of themed one I would say like, like Truxton style yeah kind of like a Truxton style one and um it's not necessarily like a huge like bullet hell one it's one of those ones where you just like memorize kind of like almost like a like an Atari feel like a Galaga one where you just want to memorize all the patterns mm -hmm. um so it's got an interesting mechanic where if you kill like full waves of enemies these little gems pop out. Uh huh. And if you get the gems, they give you bonus points, and score multipliers, and like so, it's like its own little mini game. But if you miss uh, a gem, like it resets back to like one point, and so like it goes all the way. Like you get the first one, it's at one hundred. You get the second one, it's five hundred. Then it's a thousand. Then it's like as long as you keep getting the gems, and you keep the chain going, you score higher and higher and higher. So it's like its own little mini game. And what's cool about it, which I thought is neat, is if you clear like all the enemies. Uh, throughout the stave, they have like secret waves where extra enemies will come out, and you get like more points, and you can get like extra lives and stuff. It's neat. It's, um, That's cool. Yeah. It's got a cool, cool design to it. Um, the one CC is like um, it's hard because it's like the levels are just long, like very yeah. long. It's it's a marathon. It ain't a sprint. It's one of those games where you just have to sustain for so long, and uh, you know sometimes it's just hard to focus that long. And yeah, I bet. All, so. I, well, I mean, I don't bet. I know I've done that. I've played games where it's like this is a seventy-minute long shoot 'em up. <laughs> it's fourteen mm -hmm. stages. You know, that's twenty-eight bosses, man. That's hard to keep up with. That's hard to like maintain for a long time. It's a mm -hmm. real battle of attrition between you and the game. And 
I don't always like that. I like 30 minute long shoot 'em ups, <laughs> but I buy pretty I much every one of them that comes out. So I'll give it a fair shot. I'll give it a shot. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Like I just literally, I buy all of them just cause I love the genre and I support it and I want more people to make them. And the best way to have that happen is to support them and buy them and promote them and try to get other people into them. Like, um, but I do believe, like you said, there is like kind of like a little bit of a renaissance for it, a resurgence for it. Um, the PS3 like gave no love to the genre at all. The Xbox 360 did a great job. And then it's like PS4 flipped and it like flipped like the Xbox got nothing. And the PS4 got a million amazing shmups. So, yep. And the Switch did well as well. So, yeah. But yeah, I feel like there's an appreciation for the genre. Like, and uh, I do think there are people like getting into it now. Um, and I think it helps too, because like I've, I've, I've gone over this before, like growing up, like I never realized, like you could go for a one CC in those games. Like, I just, I know it's not silly, but like the thought never even crossed my mind when it I played those it games didn't either in an arcade. Me. I was like, well, these games are literally just designed to be impossible and to yeah. steal your quarters and you know, they're fun, but they're not like, that's it. Like you want to beat it. You spend five bucks. You continue. Exactly. You right. Yeah. You that's pay $5 you to it. experience the game. Yeah. And then that's just all like, so I liked them and I always thought they were fun. I always enjoyed sh shmups and stuff, but like, I never really understood it. And then as I got older and I started seeing one CCs and stuff and it was just blown away. Like I started viewing it differently and got really into it. And I think that there's a lot of people that kind of are getting like, under, like going through a similar thing where they're, mm -hmm. they're being like, why do people like these games so much? And they're like, kind of understanding finally like, oh, wow, this is actually pretty sick. Wow, that's amazing. Like, it's beautiful when you watch um, someone, you know, like a, like a god tier player, like Jamers or somebody play those yeah. games. Like, it, it really is like beautiful. It's like watching ballet, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it is absolutely. amazing. Um, but those those people are cut from a different cloth. Like, Jamers has like nine of the hardest shmups in the world just under his belt at any point that he can 1cc. Like if, if you ask me to go in and one CC a game that I one CC like two months ago, there's no way. <laughs> like it's just mm. there's no chance. No, no, it has to be fresh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I, I have I've I try to say that too. It's like like a shmup is like when I play a shmup, like that means like I've been playing in a couple hours a day for like a week or two trying yeah. to get the one CC. And it's like you have to keep that really fresh, like all those um paths you take, all the little you know things and Mm -hmm. if you stop playing for a while you gotta relearn all of it you just don't remember it you're like oh gosh yep. and then yep. you have to die a few times to be like oh right i cannot be here when this happens like there's mm -hmm. so many things where it's, you just have to figure it out the wrong way you're like okay well i can't be here well i definitely can't be here so what do i have to all right I, like you said i gotta kill this guy and i gotta hide like up here <laughs> just stay right. on the top of the screen and that's another thing like that was like a huge revelation for me in shmups is like learning that like being at the bottom of the screen is not always the best idea. It's not like always the best idea, man. That's the yeah. convergence of <laughs> where all the bullets are, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you it, you know, when you start, you're like, well, I want to be as far away from these things as possible. So I have as much time to dodge. And, and yeah. that's not true. Like sometimes the best thing to do is you get right up in that freaking face and you just shh. Shut, shoot them in the mouth and you blow and you go to the top of the screen and you just fly around the top and you go you hot you go around all of it and stuff like that exactly. like learning learning all those things like oh makes the game so intense and so far yeah you don't you don't need to dodge bullets if they're so dead they can't shoot any of them <laughs> mm. that's the best so um what do you think is the best shmup system? You are you a 360 man? Because I saw you have quite the 360 collection. So yeah, I have a huge 360 collection. Uh it's tough to say. It's a toss-up between the 360 and the PS4, I would say. Mm -hmm. But I would probably that oh, cave collection man. on the 360, like single-handedly almost makes it better to me. I think so. Yeah. I think. I think I would have to give it to the 360. Although they are releasing a lot of those games back onto the PS4. So it's pretty close. I think I think right now the 360 just edges it out a little bit, but maybe not for long. Yeah, that's true. We'll see how many yellow lights are red rings of death or red rings of death. Take out all those. No, systems. I've never had one. That's, that's amazing. 360. 
That's like I'm terrified to collect for the 360 because I remember my friends, like all of them, having issues. They all had to replace their 360s. Yeah, I've, so. I've ha- I have like about 12 360s, and none of them have ever broken. <laughs> Not, well, I've never had an issue with any of them. That's sick. Do you collect like different models, like like uh, special editions? No, or... no, 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 no. These are just stockpiled from like crap I find, and I like mm-hmm. I'll get one console, and then I'm like, well, I need a backup to that console, and then I'll get a backup to it. And then I was like, well, I should get a third just to back that up. And then what mm-hmm. ends up happening is I go to like a yard sale or something and I pick up a big lot from someone and cherry pick out the games and I'll trade the games I don't need. But I don't want to like mess with the consoles. I don't want to try to trade those. I don't want to clean them. I don't really necessarily want to test them or pack them up or ship them. I sure as mm-hmm. hell don't want to ship them. <laughs> it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I just stuff them in a the closet and never look at them again. <laughs> That works. I have like a, I have a stack of Wii's back there, so tall that <laughs> probably I could like use it as like a dinner tray. And then right next to it, I have four in-box Xbox 360s. Nice, dude. So what, what you need to do is you need to like make an art piece out of the Wii's. Like make like you should. You need to make like a Wii game shelf out of Wii's that will hold your Wii collection. I you know, know I mean? right. Like, Blue Here's Molly. the thing, though. There's a there's a flaw in that. As cool as it would be, the Xbox 360 is blowing up right now. The prices of the games sure are going crazy. The Wii and the PS3 are soon to follow. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these kids now that were born in like 2006, mm-hmm. when those systems came out, in a couple of years, they're going to be graduating from college and getting jobs. And they're going to buy the stuff that they had when they were kids, mm-hmm. which is the Wii and the PS3 and the Xbox 360. It's already happening now. And they're going to find out that like 80% of all the Wii's are beat to hell. They're just beat up. There's Mm -hmm. just too many people that just destroyed them. So they're going to be looking for like good quality Wii's. So I'm going to hold on to them. People always talk about like, oh, it's worthless. Have you ever been to Super Potato in Tokyo? Mm -mm. A huge game store there. On the third floor, they have a throne of old Famicom cartridges that were just so worthless. No one wanted to buy them. So they glued them together. With super glue and made a throne you can sit in, and mm. it has like little Samsons in it and like oh. all kinds of stuff. And even little Samson and like the on the Famicoms worth several hundred bucks. Sure. But like they're like, it's never gonna be worth anything. It's all gonna be worth something. If it means oh, it is. something to somebody, it'll mm. be worth something one day. I've been saying that too, that like um the value on stuff is just gonna go crazy and like nothing likes like so like like psp is gonna go crazy like all of it is um yeah as stuff goes on it it, it, it's gonna be once nobody knows how good they have it until it's gone you know you know you don't know what you got it's gone it's like that's basically what's gonna happen to the world is so they're gonna shut off physical media and that's when everybody's suddenly gonna care it's right it's, it's it's gonna be and it's gonna go crazy overnight values and stuff because people will desperately want it and all the nerds like us will have hoarded it all and just be like (laughs) and you'll have nothing you should have listened (laughs) exactly right um we'll be the one standing on our porch yelling at the kids on the other mm -hmm. side of the fence to my goal wrong i was right (laughs) i'm actually we have a question here though someone asked were either Mm -hmm. of you able to beat gradius or contra using the konami code yeah, I beat it with the Konami code. I can beat both of them without the Konami code, though, too. So, uh, so when I was a kid, I could beat Contra um, I, with the code. I did, but I, I never could be. I didn't ever use it to play Gradius, and I've never beaten Gradius. No, really, Absolutely it's not that bad. Know. It's pretty easy no. on the NES. Um, no. if it, it's literally the inventor of the saying Gradius syndrome. So I know you can't get hit one time. <laughs> Correct. So if you if it's like well, I R type similar. That's the same way I used to play R type. Like I would just yeah. start the game over if I died. Yep. Like if I lost my power ups, I'm like just replay the whole game. Um, what I'll do is with those games is I'll find a couple of spots along the way, maybe in like stage three, and then one in stage five, and I'll learn and I'll practice how to recover from that point. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to do it all in one go. You just have to like do it in thirds. <laughs> And the games with checkpoint systems like Gradius and mm. R-Type will often, they won't make it easy on you to recover, not by no. a long shot, but they will work in a way where it's a possibility. If you practice it enough, you can recover at those spots. 
but that's a lot of work. You know, you have to have like a modern version of it where it lets you start at the beginning of a level or like a rewind feature or uh, like use a save state or something in an emulator. I've been known mm -hmm. to do that. I don't really use emulators, but I'll use them to practice a shmup. And then I'll go back and play it on the real system after I've practiced it. Cause I don't want to spend 45 minutes playing through a freaking game to have like a 15 second chance to learn a pattern on a mini boss, <laughs> like it blows me away and then have to do it all again. No, I'm 100% uh, a full uh, in support of using emulators to practice shmups because like I was saying earlier, like, especially like true last bosses and stuff like that. It's like, you know, it might be like one out of 50 attempts to even see the guy. Right. And then like, you know, and then you're sweating. Your heart's beating out of your chest because you never see him and you're, you're so worried anyway. And it's like you can't even really focus. And, um, you know, as well as I do that, it's like it's like I call it like sight reading. Uh, it's like music. Same thing. It's like you can't sight read just in the most amazing piece of music and play it perfectly unless you're a god. You have to practice it a few times. Even exactly. if you can play it and you're amazing, just doing it on the fly and just be like, oh, sure. Blah, 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 blah. It's so it's that's inhuman. It's like, I'm, a, I'm a I'm a really good sight reader. And oh, uh, I love to sight read and I've, I've, I've sight read entire set lists before I'm going to be sight reading one this next coming week. Um, but that's an amazing skill, man. Did so. you, did you know that there are competitions where musicians get together and gamble on sight reading for like, a I've guy seen, will, like, I've seen like, old you know, you bring him a piece yeah. of music on the piano and if he can't sight read it, like he'll give you a hundred bucks. And if he can, you owe him a hundred bucks. And wow. People will bring in crazy stuff and they'll just, he'll, they'll just like nail it. They're really, really, really good. When Steve Vai played for Frank Zappa, Frank Zappa would tell people in the audience to bring him a piece of music. And if he couldn't play it, then he wouldn't get paid for the night. And people would go out of their way to like bring him crazy pieces of music. And he never <laughs> failed. He never failed. Mm -hmm. That's so I streamed on Instagram like a, a set list. I played at a country club on guitar and I played for like two and a half or three hours and about mm -hmm. A third of that was music I'd never played or seen before. And I just sight read it. And I was reading off piano notation too. They gave me like a, a piano book, a Reader's Digest classic jazz <laughs> piano book. <laughs> that's amazing, man. Like I can, uh, that's, that's not the musician I am. I'm, I'm one of those that has to be prepared and practice. I'm not like a jam, jam guy at all. I'm like, no, no, no. I got to write my parts. I just, I can't do that. Like, I can't just be like, oh, we're playing in C, C sharp. Let's go. We yeah, like, do it. Just, that's just not me, man. Like, but you, I'm not classically trained at all or anything yeah. like that. Like I said, like I, you know, I learned music theory in high school, learned the circle of fifths or whatever. But yeah. it. <laughs> like, I never really, uh, you learned about the basic trained. modes, you learned about the Aeolian mode and the Dorian and the Phrygian and the Lydian and all that. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, I could read sheet music before I could read words. Like I knew how to read sheet music before I, could spell cat so mm. it's so ingrained into me that i never have known anything else i still teach guitar like a day a week just because i don't want to abandon my students that are trying to like audition for music scholarship soon mm -hmm. um but they're like, <laughs> they like literally you... need help <laughs> yeah i mean right so i don't want to abandon them they've been taken from me for like better part of a decade so mm -hmm. uh they're like when did you learn to to play like an F bar chord. I was like, I don't even remember doing it. Like I have no recollection of playing or learning to play a bar chord. I've just been able to do it since I was seven. <laughs> it's, it's been like that. So it really is a part of me, but so is gaming. You know, I've, mm -hmm. I started playing video games three months after I started playing guitar. We're talking like 42 years almost. That's mm -hmm. people used to not live this long. <laughs> <laughs> I've spent yeah. like half my life playing things, video games and music. It's awesome. I wouldn't have it any other way, but it's just strange to think about it. It is strange to think about it. And like I said, like I never, I don't know. I feel like I didn't appreciate it growing up that how lucky I feel like I am now to have grown up when I did as far as like what media and entertainment I got to experience. Like, oh man, so lucky. And I got like all the benefits of the internet without any of the issues of growing up with it which I think was a huge thing too. Like I um, gotta be honest. Like I like the fact that I'd be like, all right, parents, I'm going to uh, Tony's. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like they would yeah. have to believe me. <laughs> yeah. Nowadays kids are like, 
they're like, okay, well, I'm going to put, let me just put the GPS tracker in your head and you're going to check in. Yep. And I'm going to pull up the camera and watch you and make sure you're not listening to you while you're there. It's like, oh yep. my goodness. Yeah, yep. that's different. Exactly. Thing. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, uh, as far as video games go, like, what was like your first system? Was it, was it Atari? Was it in television? Or you no, 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 no. My first system was the NES. I was okay. at my cousin's house. They lived way, 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 way out in the country. And when I say way out in the country, I'm I'm from Alabama. So country is like, we're talking out in the country. 50 minute drives to the nearest gas station kind of out in the country. But they had a flipping NES. I'd never seen a video game in my life. And I was like, what is happening on the TV? Mm. I saw he was like playing this thing. He had something in his hand. He was pressing buttons and the things he was doing was corresponding to what I was seeing. I was like, can I try? And he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> he did not let me try. And he told me the name of it was a Nintendo. And I remembered that. And I told it to my parents and my mom and my dad. And I never, they never bought me crap, crap. Hey, Bill Bones. <laughs> they never bought me anything. They did buy me an NES for Christmas uh, in 1987. Sick. And I, uh, I loved it. It was like the Mario Duck Hunt world-class track meet set. And oh, it was you, the first time the, I ever stayed up pad? all night. Did you have the, the track? I did have the power pad. Oh, hell yeah. Dude. But I was all into Mario. I mean, we played some Doug Hunt, but it was all mm. about Mario. My family had a rule that uh, you could open one present on Christmas Eve. instead. Of we Christmas did the same morning. thing. Yeah, we did the same and thing. And the present I picked out was just a small box. I thought it was a book. I like to read. And I opened mm -hmm. it up, and it was a Nintendo game. It was Mike Tyson's Punch Out. And so the cat was out of the bag then, right? They mm -hmm. knew I knew that they had bought me an NES because I opened up an NES game, and mm -hmm. uh, they let me go ahead and open the NES, and I stayed up all flipping <laughs> night, all flipping <laughs> I, night. I also learned uh, something about Santa Claus that night because uh, <laughs> I was like watching, I was watching the whole time. <laughs> That's cute, uh, but. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of fun, and I loved it. And I've played, I've never stopped gaming since. There were some times where I like got away from consoles and I just played PC stuff, especially when I got like addicted to World of Warcraft, like everybody else. Dude, we're like I've the same never, person. This is I've so I've never weird. gone. I did the same thing. <laughs> I've never gone more than like a month of my life without playing a video game. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was. It's it's um. There was a, there was a part of my there was a point in my life where I thought that I was going to like stop gaming as a hobby like that did happen like I remember like it was the cusp like after the Genesis and after the Super Nintendo um, and like I just thought I was going to like grow out of it and I wasn't going to be into it anymore and that kids you know games were for kids they were very kiddy and um, that's when PlayStation One came out and and they were like no bro we're going to give you edgy teen content that you've been waiting for we're giving you twisted metal and resident evil and legacy kane and all these games that i was like this isn't for kids they planned it perfectly mm -hmm. like games they, grew up with us so they pulled me right back in man i was they, like people talk about go back in they talk about harry potter now harry potter was a little bit after my time like harry potter got big when i was in college but oh, these shit. kids that were like eight when the first Harry Potter came out, when the <laughs> next book came out, they were the same age as Harry Potter. They grew up. All the people that made games like grew up with us, like games for mm -hmm. edgy teens came out when we were teens and then like mm -hmm. games for adults came out when we were adults. So there's there's been no reason to move away from it. It's just gotten better. I still love old stuff and I love new stuff, too. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad that there's always been good content for me at the appropriate age the whole time i've been doing it that's true and My someone asked have i ever tried to play music using braille sheet just to sharpen your skills yes i have i've i've taught a couple of visually impaired students that read off of braille and i learned to read it well enough to kind of help them but i don't know that i could sight read off braille right now and it's hard to sight read braille when you play guitar because uh yeah you need your you hands three arms <laughs> yeah <laughs> That is an issue. Um, so I know you said you were into music and stuff like that. Um, before the show, we were talking a little bit. You said that you were like in a band that you played some uh, technical death metal. I've been in a lot of bands, but yeah, I was in a band called DeLeo. We did technical death metal stuff, it, like mm -hmm. gent, as they would say now. Okay. And uh, 
yeah, it was an interesting experience. Um, I founded it with another guy. Uh, he was the drummer from a local group called Unsung Zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was like one of these like heavy rhythmic bass kind of like groove at time signature changing sort of bands and with mm -hmm. screamed vocals. And it was a lot of fun. And we, we got fairly big. Like I said, we were touring with some larger bands, but my, my day job prevented me from being able to do that. So I, mm -hmm. uh, I essentially just sort of excused myself from the band and signed over my intellectual property rights to them so they could own the music and things like that. But it was a, it was a fun and rewarding experience, but, other than that, you know, I've, I've filled in with do dozens of different bands for like short little legs of tours when their guitarist broke their arm or got a DUI or, <laughs> or whatever. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, I've done that. Very but most easy. of my work that I've done has been session work, like in the studio and things like that. I'm, I'm the guy they bring in when the guitarist can't nail the solo. And mm -hmm. he's been working on it for 10 hours and they're, they're paying $300 an hour for studio time. And they're like going to go broke. So they'll bring me in to like record it real quick. Or now they don't even bring me in. I just do it on my computer and like email it to them. <laughs> so exactly. Now you just uh, do it at home. But yeah, that's, that's kind of my background. And I, I still play gigs because I just like to play. But these days it's like this upcoming week I'm playing uh, the, the after dinner party for a, a golf tournament at, at a fancy country club. And then I'm playing it up. They say it's a funeral, and I don't normally take funeral gigs. I don't want to play at a funeral. Mm. They suckered me into it. <laughs> they asked me if I could play on a specific night. I thought it was going to be for their happy hour or for dinner or something, and then later told me it was a funeral. Uh, but it's – Is that also going to be degenter? No, <laughs> it's not. It's not going to be gent. I'm going to be playing a lot of like – <laughs> <laughs> No, No, nothing like that. Yeah, no, nothing like that. But mm – -hmm. uh, yeah, it's going to be weird. I, I don't know. I feel tricked for playing this one, but sometimes that happens. It's it, that, unfortunate that's what, that I only have to take the gigs I want to take. I turned down about 80% of them. My brother, he he's a piano player, and he does like some, some local gigs. He, a similar thing happened to him. He got roped into doing like a funeral recently. It's an odd request, but I don't know. Um, but back to your point earlier about the, the studio musician thing. Like I That is like a a big thing. I don't think people realize how many bands can't play their own songs, dude. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there's a band, if you're in the so middle scene, many. there's a band that they are fairly big. They were nominated for a Grammy. Mm. They're not from this area, but they were recording here with one of the producers that I used to work with a lot. And between me and the producer, that band played about zero notes on that entire freaking album. Like, none. I played every guitar part. I played every bass part. I played keys. <laughs> and I played drums, like, poorly. And, I mean, everything was quantized. So, you're just dragging the notes and putting mm -hmm. them in the right spot. We, like, copied and pasted their music together. Yeah. Uh, and it was just... It, it was a nightmare. Like it was an absolute disaster. It, was it, was it Lorna, Lorna Shore? No, I'm just kidding. It was not Lorna Shore. Right, I'm just kidding. It was not Lorna Shore. I'm talking like shit. I think those guys are awesome. No, 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 no. They can play from what I hear. <laughs> Lorna Shore, it's weird to me that they're like so popular because they just sound like the crap I listened to 20 years ago. It just sounds like Emperor. Like it's just yeah. Emperor. Yeah. It's just symphonic black metal, like extreme black metal. It's like for hipsters. It's like it's it's like kids just have found out about it for the first time. They're just time. finding out about it. That's fine. Yeah. Let them have it. I don't want and, to and, and their um their image is modern. They yeah, their image like is modern. The, they're but I would rather I'd, I'd rather listen to Emperor all day long. So yeah. Yeah, I love black metal, dude. Oh, we got another question. Are you afraid bands will be a thing of the past due to AI or competition? For instance, is there a contest for drumming beats per minute? Could a human ever beat an AI? Um, there are some drummers that are like at the maximum, I guess, physical level you could ever be at. They can play so fast that it's like two twenty, almost like a hum. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think AI is going to have a big part of music. AI has had a big part of music for a long time. They've been using algorithms to determine what parts of songs are hits, what good hooks are. They've been mm -hmm. doing that for twenty years. Uh, 
And so I have no doubt that that will be a huge influence, especially in pop music. But I think, like with anything, there'll be a big pushback from people wanting a more natural sound. 100%. I, uh, my daughter, she likes pop music. She listens to all that stuff, but like, I'll play a song for her in the car. And the other day we were listening to, uh, we we're just on like an eighties pop kick, but we were listening to the go-go's. We we're listening to that song. We got the beat and we got the beat is not on a straight tempo. It is. They slow down and they speed up and Belinda Carlisle, the lead singer, she sings out of tune. Mm -hmm. And I was like, doesn't that sound good? Doesn't that sound good? It's natural. Mm -hmm. And my yep. daughter, 100% who's 10, was like, yeah, it sounds like a real person. And right. I was like, she gets it. It's a real person. Mm -hmm. AI is real cool. But there's nothing cooler than sitting there and watching someone actually, who's a master of their craft, like perform something. 100%. And so I think there will be, even though AI is going to take over the world, and there's going to be a lot of that in the music we listen to. And it's going to be good. We're going to like it because it's going to be designed for us to love. It's just going to be like nonstop hooks the whole way through. You think you get a song stuck in your head now? Wait till AI figures it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. But there's still going to be that like raw sound that people want. And I think people are going to start enjoying both of it. You can go to a five-star Michelin restaurant and eat the finest food you've ever had you can have like truffle vapor blown in your face sometimes man you just want to eat a hot dog so <laughs> i think that people are going to enjoy both but i do think it's going to be very prevalent in the recording industry it already is i think that's extremely on point um in so ai is going to take over to not in just the music industry it's going to be have a huge impact in movies tvs and games as well like you're going to see ai created content all across the board and um it's going to be like a similar argument so this is what i'll compare it to it's like um cds sound much 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 better than mp3s and, and mp4s and stuff they sound significantly superior but nobody cares because they're not as convenient and easy as uh, mp3s and putting them on an ipod people don't want to carry around 100 cds that's just convenience so people will sacrifice quality for easier consumption and easier use so there will be a huge market for ai but that doesn't mean that it's the best and there will always be people that actually do care about having the best and they'll seek out something better um but i think you also hit the nail on the head that like when i listen to music when I hear a real drum kit, I am immediately like, oh, it's real drums. That's a real drum. Like, it sounds so much better to me than like a purely digitized kit where, like you said, everything's been perfectly notated and everything. There's no flaming. There's no mistakes. It's not like, like, I like listening to the old Amana Marth albums and the old Emperor albums and the old yeah. where the drumming's like you said, it's not perfect. It's not. 100 percent right it's a little little messy but it's it's real to me it's it's human i can feel it in a way that digital music doesn't do the same thing and i'll compare it to this too it's like when you watch a movie and you see computer or cgi or whatever like your mind can tell that's not real yeah like you see that and you go no matter how cool it looks and how good it looks you're like well that's not real and i have the same thing with music when i hear digital drums and digital stuff i'm like oh that sounds it looks sounds really good but that's that's not real that's, i mean it's true like when you go back and you watch practical effects and you they just feel so much better that's what's going to be 100%. like with music right you mentioned a monomarth once sent from the golden hall uh, yeah. was one of my favorite songs of theirs and that album's so great but it they slow down like 20 beats per minute during that song the drummer yeah. played that in one take and he got so tired from the double kick <laughs> that he literally couldn't keep it up mm -hmm. and they just recorded to that and it it's about vikings marching man they're gonna get tired it makes it more real right than if you're like oh, yeah. locked in at 120 bpm all the way through and you're listening to a metronome in your ears while you're recording so i think that there's going to be like a big push for authenticity yep agreed and and and, and you'll see that in games too so there'll be like a million ai generated platformers and stuff like that they won't be celeste they're not gonna you know be what i mean they're, they're not gonna be celeste where it's like 
unbelievably well crafted levels and unbelievably well written stories and unbelievably deep themes that are human that like AI will never ever be able to convey. And yeah. Also, AI all it can do is it can amalgamate information and make a copy of it like a sophisticated copy it's never going to create a new thing there will not be a new music genre or a new vibe of playing guitar a new way of it's just they won't think of it maybe or, there will be i don't know i don't know about that i think that AI has like infinite possibilities. So eventually, if you throw enough crap at the wall, some of it's going to stick. Eventually, AI will create something that has never been done before that people like. And I don't know that I want to be there for that. <laughs> I don't know that I want that to be a thing. Mm -hmm. But I think it will happen. There's always, whenever there's a new technological advancement, whenever mm -hmm. humanity discovers something new, the generation that discovers it never knows what the hell to do with it. That's they never right. know what to do with it. They do stupid crap with it. When they created uh, like the sound, like recording, the ability to record music and sound, they didn't record music. They just recorded like people talking, doing stuff. poems. Like, it never occurred to them to do it. It waited until the next generation. When they mm -hmm. recorded or the, developed the ability to make film, first thing that pops into their mind, let's just like record animals. Like, why well, mm. try to make a story out of it? You needed the next generation to come on and be like, we can use this as a narrative. My favorite one is when they created anesthesia. Oh, my God, we have a chemical now that can put people to sleep. No one had the idea of like, hey, we can use this for surgery. Instead, they're like, let's all go stand in a room and huff this crap and pass out and pay 50 cents to do that. that. We'll been wake me. up, that right? That would have been, been that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, the first generation doesn't know what to do with the technology. They have the the foresight to create it, but not the ability to predict where it's going to go. And that's what's happening with AI right now. Eventually, someone's going to come up with some idea for AI, like they're going to create like a an antibiotic that can go into your body and target the specific illness you have based on your genetic makeup. Right? That'd be sweet. Oh my There's god! There's going to be I'm, stuff like that. Give me so an injection that makes me. So I have no doubt that, almost. like, maybe computer music, AI music, becomes its own genre, and people really like that. Who knows? Maybe it'll be a great thing. Maybe it'll be like Star Trek, and we just talk to some computer, and they do everything for us. Right? So who knows? I'm I'm nope. I'm cautiously optimistic, but I'm scared as hell. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel. It could go. It could go one of two ways. It could be amazing, or it could be just the most authoritarian, evil, scary thing that ever could possibly happen. Yeah, so we'll see. You know, it could go Terminator. It could go lots of ways. <laughs> yeah, we have a couple questions here. I've seen someone use AI to add vocals and sound effects to some old silent films. Isn't that interesting? You, yeah, it is interesting. Uh, it's fascinating. I heard an AI the other day that had taken. Oh God, what was that song? It was um, Men From Work, I Come From A Land Down Under, a classic 80s banger. And it had taken the lyrics and vocals from Metallica's One and put it on top of it. And it was perfect. <laughs> it was everything I've ever wanted in a song, <laughs> but it was all done with an AI. And so, yeah, I think that's really interesting that even, even the AI can like read the lips and put the, the correct diction and enunciation on things. That's interesting. I do want to see where it goes, but I'm looking forward to AI doing things like fixing movies that are missing scenes and mm. old pictures that are like deteriorated that belong to families and stuff. That's what we're going to start seeing initially. So that's uh, one of the things that I think will be interesting as far as gaming goes with AI too, is that like eventually like it's, it's going to be a, the point where not everyone gets the same narrative experience in the games because you'll be able to customize the type of experience you want through ai yeah that'll so be like, interesting so you could be like i'd like to play a call of duty game but you know what i want it to be in hawaii and i also want to have a horse and i also want to you know go skiing and like you can just tell the ai like what you want to do in the game and then it's just going to like make it's going to pull up a bunch of assets and put it in there and you're going to be able to have whatever experience that you want. And then like once we get to that point where AI can do that, like will there be a gaming industry? Right. Well, will it, it even exist? To, this is one of the times you have to rely on prompt. 
Right. You have to rely on capitalism to save the day in this case, <laughs> because they'll have to gate that. Right. Because if they create that experience, like why would anybody buy any other game? You get exactly what you want. So you're going to have to place restrictions on it. We're going to have to place restrictions on AI. Otherwise, we're going to end up, like I said, the Star Trek. What was the the, the, the thing they went in the holiday? Holodeck. Hell yeah. That would be the downfall of freaking humanity, dude. Yeah, no all anybody would, would do is work long enough to have enough money to go into the holodeck, and then that's all that would ever happen. So yeah, it's true. We want humanity to succeed. We're going to have to put restrictions on that. Yeah, this is something we, we kind of dabble on sometimes. We talk about VR gaming and stuff like that and the potentials for like harm the gaming world where eventually if it's such a better experience than reality will anyone spend time in reality or will it be like a voluntary matrix thing we're all hooked up to pods because we want to be because you know we live in uh, a climate change destroyed dystopian future but we all could go in and you know play games forever and live happily in there it's i know right one weird, microsecond man. of real reality is a trillion years in this alternate reality I only have so there's only one thing about that that I do think will be great is I hope there's less traffic. Yeah. So if maybe yeah. if like maybe if 80% of the people hook themselves up to pods and they're all just playing, you know, whatever the newest game is, you know, I can like go to a store and there'll be no lines and get in and out quick, you know, that'd be all right. You still think there'll be stores? You still think you can drive? It won't just be all delivery. Uh, you're probably right. <laughs> you're probably right. <laughs> Probably won't be any stores. Uh, Let's get this is getting too dark, man. Let's talk about something happier, not the downfall of humanity. <laughs> so, no, well, let's go back to talking about shmups. I, 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 uh, speaking of the downfall of humanity, like I was playing, you, you like Mushi a lot, right? Yeah, I love uh, if you select Ultra at the beginning, it literally asks you, it says, like, Are you ready for pure despair? Yes, <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, that's a good game, any game that tells cool. you that. <laughs> it's literally nightmare fuel. So have you ever played a video game so much that you start dreaming about it? Oh, God, dude. Beat Saber has invaded my life. It's, yeah, uh, I played so mm -hmm. much Mushihime Sama that, no joke, I was at a friend's house. And I was in his bathroom. And I was looking at the wallpaper. And it had, like, Florida Lees and Napoleonic Bees in it. Mm -hmm. And I swear <laughs> I could see them cascading down the wall and i was like weave <laughs> you get like i'm finding like routes through it like you press all over the bathroom dude i'm sorry i was i was not <laughs> yeah, bad it was bad but um yeah that it, it was such just an experience like getting the one cc on mushihime sama uh oh it must have been amazing it took longer for me to get it just on normal and normal would be like hard on any other shmup Mm -hmm. and maniac is like a different set of rules like it doesn't even work the same right mm -hmm. it's almost like three different games put into one and i think that's one of the things that makes mushi one of the most popular competitive shoot 'em ups even to this day there's just so much you have the you only have two characters but they each have two different kind of loadouts mm -hmm. and it adds so much variety to that game and also it has a unique feature that the end of the third stage, which is the halfway point of the game, is the hardest point of the entire game. Mm -hmm. It requires you to be absolutely perfect with your timing. And I love how they put like the gatekeeping point at the middle of the game and made the first two stages enjoyable for everybody. Anybody should be able to beat the first stage of Mushi. Yeah. And have a decent shot at the second one, but the third one just throws you to the wolves and from there it just escalates i love that it reminds me of like riding a roller coaster mm -hmm. there's this long period of you're just going up this hill and like there's this excitement and anticipation that's so palpable that you know there's like electricity in the air and then you feel this crest and you plateau over the top and then it's just insanity from then on out mm-hmm I think they just captured that perfectly. And that's the reason it, it usually comes in on number one on like Schmup's Forum's top 25 games and has stayed there the last five or six times they've done it. Yeah, I completely agree with you that that third stage is like one of the best design stages in all Schmup history. It's absolutely, yeah. it is so amazing. So basically what it is, if you guys never played the game, it's like the third stage is a boss. Like the whole 
stage is like one giant alien creature and you 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 move through it and you have to like take out certain sections of it um at a time that's the right stage i'm not right wrong right that's the, the third no one. the third stage in the in okay. Mushi <laughs> is the one where the centipedes are crawling up out of the ground you're basically like in an ant hill oh and... i thought it was the one with the giant boss mm -hmm. i guess i'm wrong and uh, you have to stream to get, so there's no way to dodge the bullets. It's literally impossible. Mm -hmm. And you have to time the bullet cancels. So when you. Oh, okay. So that's, yes, that's the ones, the big ones jumping out the sides that fill yep, the yep. whole so, screen. Yeah. So the whole screen's like cascading. And if yeah, you have yeah, never yeah. played a game with bullet cancels, the way it works is there'll be a large enemy on the screen. And when you kill it, all the bullets on the screen turn into like score multipliers. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is you have to like draw these thousands of bullets towards you and then time it perfectly so you take out the enemy at right the right the time and then you zip over to the next location and you wait for the next big enemy to come out and mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of fun and there's also it's built in that the game slows down because there's so many sprites on the screen the processor starts chugging along mm -hmm. feeling those like bullets close in on you and things start slowing down it's almost like a bullet time that's built in using the hardware rather than like a software kind of technique mm -hmm. and uh it's a phenomenal experience and brutally difficult brutally oh, difficult. No, there's insane. very little margin for error when you do it yes yeah, so basically what happens with those is the amount of room you have to dodge is so minimal that if you're not in the right place at the start of it and you move in the wrong direction you're no longer dpsing the target you need to and like you'll go away from where you need to be and you, you'll you get overwhelmed and you die. So like you said, you have to know where to be before it even starts because you're right. going to have to like put your damage on the guy and dodge. And while you're dodging, still put your damage on him so that when you get there, it takes him out at the right time. And if you're off just a little bit, like you just like die, die. It's not dying. He's not dying. <laughs> you die. Yeah. It's like it's so yeah. frustrating. Or you just, you know, do it, you know, spam a bomb. Yeah. Spam a bomb. But if you yeah, spam too man. many bombs, you won't have enough to get through the last boss because you're required to have enough to because some of her patterns are undodgeable. So literally yes. can't do it. And your hitbox in Mushihime Sama is one pixel. And mm -hmm. it's still almost impossible to dodge. I always thought it had the fairest hitbox of like any shmup. Like I love the way that one works. It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. It's just um, so hard. I always tell people if you want to have a great time. And you want to look like the greatest gamer of all time, and you want to play a shmup, put on Mushihime Sama Futari's arrange mode. Mm. It's really easy to get the one credit clear on that, and you look like you're the best gamer of all time. <laughs> <laughs> so many bullets, but you like absorb the bullets as they get close to you. So yeah, okay. it looks like you're like dodging a lot, and there's all this stuff going on, but it's really about like a just racking up a high score and not trying to survive. So Which, I really like that. And if I ever go back and play Mushihime Sama Futari, I usually play the arrange mode because it's just so much fun. Yep. That's, that's how I, uh, Crimson Clover is the same way for me. Yep. I, I love the arcade mode, don't, but like the yeah. arrange mode is just so fun, dude. Yeah. Because it's got like that huge power up chart and you can, you know, blast it. And it's, it, it's, it's just a lot more relaxing. It's a lot easier to get the 1cc. And sometimes it's just, like you said, it's nice to be able to play a shmup and not have to have it be like a life or death experience where <laughs> your heart's beating out of your chest and you're just kind of chilling and just enjoying yourself a little bit. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Well, the best part about playing shoot 'em ups is you get into this like flow state where like your instincts yep. are taking over and you're just executing these series of maneuvers and attacks that you have to do. And it, it's really nice. It, it's like playing music. Like, you know, the song, you're just performing. Correct. And but sometimes you don't want to put in freaking 200 hours to get that good. You just want to mm -hmm. like have it come easy to you. You just want to play Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> And I like shmups where you're playing Mary Had a Little Lamb, right? They're they're they can be equally as fun if you do it right. Sometimes they suck, but sometimes they're good. Is there a difference between regular shmups and bullet holes? So yes. So a bullet hole is a subcategory of shmup. So most people would probably agree with me that a bullet hole is where there's a lot of bullets, like a blanket of bullets coming down the screen, and they're slow. And the gameplay rather than focuses rather on Instead of dodging large groups of bullets and worming your way around, it's like finding little niches and small little cracks in this curtain of bullets to work your way through it. 
So Mushihime Sama is definitely a bullet hill, but something like Raiden is not a bullet hill. It's just a, a standard shoot 'em up, just fast bullets. You got to no, be quick with your reaction time. Most mm-hmm. bullet holes, you don't have to have a lot of reaction time. You're just kind of like micro maneuvering through things. Yeah, good way. Like that's a good way to putting it. So, like in Raiden, uh, some of the older shmups, the enemies usually will target you with their bullets, shoot them where you are, and really fast, and you have to move out of the way. Whereas a, the bullet hell philosophy is more like not. I mean, they do target you to an extent. I'm not saying they don't, but it's more like we're gonna blanket the whole screen. Not necessarily just shoot at you and have you dodge. We're going to make the whole screen bullets. And you have to figure out, like you said, the pattern, the path through it. So it's not just you moving. It's you going forward and then left and and doing that. And then seeing the bullets converge and seeing where they split and figuring out the the way through it. And um, that's like, it's so good. Because like you said, like, I love how it, it, you don't, you're not like thinking. You're not like, I'm going to go left. I'm going to go right. I'm going to go right. You're just, it like accesses this instinctual part of your brain that like is like your survival mechanism or something. And, and you're just doing it. And like, I don't know it. It's so, like it says, it puts you in this state that like, I can't describe like my my girlfriend, she she laughs because she's like, you know, when I'm like really into it, she can talk to me and I'm just like, "Uh uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm just, I am like on another planet. Like I'm so just into it so it's it's like it, nothing else does that for me like that it's like the only one of the only genres that do that people it, it's interesting with shoot 'em ups because if you haven't spent time with them there's a lot of nuance to it that you never think about like most people just think like man this guy's really good at dodging look how good his reaction time is and stuff there are only certain things you could ever do with shooting a bullet right you can shoot let's say in a shoot 'em up the enemy can shoot a bullet in a specific pattern like a set pattern we're going to shoot three bullets out equidistant from each other they're going to come down they can do that they can shoot a bullet at you where you're at they can shoot random bullets out in some random pattern but the one that happens all the time that people don't get is that the computer can shoot a bullet not where you're at but where you're going to be based on the velocity you're traveling at at that second in the game so if you don't stop your motion or alter your course you're going to collide with a bullet and what comes down to like what makes a shoot 'em up great is how different developers will layer those ideas on top of each other so cave who put out mushihime sama that we've been talking about is a master of mixing those and what they'll love to do is give you a blanket of bullets in a semi-set pattern that you weave your way through then while you're mm-hmm. weaving your way through it, they'll shoot bullets at you in specific spots or directly that at you. Force shoot them going to be. Yeah. And it's how you overcome that. So you're working within constraints of these tight bullet formations, but then you have to still improvise on top of that. So while you're in this flow state and you're executing these actions that you've practiced over and over again, you still have to think on your feet. And that's mm-hmm. what makes those so great compared to a lot of other shoot 'em ups where maybe the developers didn't know what they were doing (laughs) 100 oh man you really understand shmups so a good shmup forces your hand like it's like it's gonna put that blanket out there and so you'll be like okay cool no problem i just stay right here it'll go right past me but then it will be like no friend i'm gonna shoot these triple line bullets at you that forces you out of that little safe zone now you have to go towards this pattern and so now you have to think about how to go up and around and through it. And at the same time, cave games will be like, we knew you were going to do that too. So there's actually a second wave coming in. And it just so happens that this converges into a solid line at the same second you try to move through. It's like, yeah. oh my God, it's so like those games are so tightly tuned. It is phenomenal. Like they're, they're the masters. Um I, I see. I, I swear to God, too. I saw something on Twitter that they were coming out with a new game. Um, I don't know if it's a they phone do, game or a mobile there's game. There's a or new something. Dodon Pachi game in development. Mm. I think it's being published by Cave. I don't think they're developing it, though. Okay. And they claim it's for that the Arcadia arcade, but I'm sure it'll be released to the PS4 or something. No one's going to buy an Arcadia. Nope. <laughs> pay fifteen hundred dollars for a freaking cart that's just a 
like a USB thumb drive. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Cave's like a shell of itself. They're just relying on their old products, but maybe it's better that they like went out on a high note and didn't just, mm. they passed the torch on to other people. I mean, the people that made Cl Crimson Clover, that's almost exactly like a cave game. That's and true. We always have these cave games to play. It's not like you get really tired of them. You know, you just get better at them. No. So there's they, so they're much there's infinite replayability. It's not like playing a Call of Duty campaign where you're like, I know where everything is. I want something new. Just keep playing yeah. the same old stuff and enjoy the new stuff and let it be a little different. How many of you guys go out right now and you listen to music and you're like, damn, you know what I really want to hear? Alexander's Ragtime Band. Man, that was the jam in 1918. I want to hear that crap again. You move on to new stuff. Everybody mm -hmm. does. But sometimes it's good to go back and revisit the the hits, right? We still like to listen to Bohemian Rhapsody. Mushihime Sama Futari is like Bohemian Rhapsody. You're never going to get tired of it. It's timeless. I completely agree with you. It's, it's, um, it's evergreen because... First of all, no one's ever beat every mode with every ship, and unless you're like some sort of god, so you can always go back and try a different ship or something like that. Yeah. And then, um, like you said about like I don't know, man, you ever have any of those friends who don't actually like are stuck and they only listen to like music up until 2006? You don't have any friends? Like that? I, do, <laughs> I do, I do, I so like I said, They're I played in like... Nashville and stuff, and my dad was a, a guitarist, and I grew up listening to like classic country. Mm. And the period of country that I listened to the most was like the 80s and 90s because that was what was on the radio my dad listened to mm -hmm. and uh, what my friends you like whaling? To. Huh? Do you like whaling? <laughs> yeah, I love whaling Jennings, man. Get oh, some yeah. whaling Jennings out there. Yeah, I like the outlaw country stuff. I like in that. my opinion, country music for me ends in like 1999. <laughs> There's no <laughs> more. When I get my wife's car, she has XM radio. I'm like, let's put on prime country. And it's like best of the country, 1980s and 90s. And I'm like, it's just George Strait, Shania Twain, and like Alan Jackson. I'm like, this is fine. I can yeah. survive this. Mm -hmm. But if you flip over to like Y2 country, like country from the 2000s, it's unlistenable to me. So I think it's okay to be like that for some things. I don't want to mm -hmm. necessarily uh, fill my brain up with more of something I don't really like. <laughs> but yeah, I know plenty of people that are like, Dude, no music came out after 2006. This is the end of it. We're just, this is what I had on my iPod yeah. when I was a senior in college, and this is all that will ever be on there. It's true. It's just like, I'm just like, yeah, I, you know, I like Soulfly, but, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. <laughs> did you listen to the, uh, did you listen to the Nightmare Before Christmas revisited album where they uh, had a bunch of like, new metal bands and stuff recover all the music from the nightmare before christmas i have not heard that no oh my lord i, Soul I heard all shall perish's christmas album that was freaking amazing. oh really no dude they so have like good. marilyn manson and like corn and stuff on this album and Soulfly was supposed to do one of the songs on it or whatever and it it didn't make the cut they got flyleaf to do what is this instead of wow that anyway, I listened to the uh, the recording of that, and it was like they were right not to put that on the album. <laughs> That's the last thing I heard by them. That's hilarious. Yeah. All right, so there is another topic that um, I just we have to talk about before uh, I let it slip away because I am extremely passionate, like one of my favorite games of all time. Like I'm talking, I have five thousand logged hours in this game is the binding of isaac yeah five thousand hours i've got okay. probably a, about three thousand mm -hmm. gameplay and probably about five thousand hours of watching streamers play it and other players northern lion and sinvicta and yep sinvicta and um uh gosh what's what's wrong with me what's the guy with the, the dreads i used to always watch can't remember now he, he hasn't been on for a while that's not the point but my point is that uh i have about 100 hours in repentance <laughs> so that's I've got about 220 in repentance yeah when when uh, i saw your channel and you were talking about binding of isaac and how you were just so upset about how repentance went down i'm like oh god i'm so glad that you've talked about this because i felt like the same exact way like i've never had a game that i've loved so much like leave such a sour taste in my mouth 
after an expansion came out, I was like, dude, what is this? Like, come they on. ruined, they ruined Repentant. They ruined the game. In case yeah. you guys don't know, Binding of Isaac is a roguelite. Mm-hmm. It takes the the concept of like the dungeons from the original Legend of Zelda and mixes it with like random generated dungeons and random item pools. And you're trying to mm-hmm. piece together out of this randomness a run that's good enough to help you succeed in beating the game. Mm-hmm. And they took all the cool items and made them weaker. Mm-hmm. They took everything that was like a 10 out of 10 and they made it like a 7 out of 10. And then they took everything that was like a 1 out of 10 and they made it like a 3 out of 10. So it went from this really fun experience where you build this really overpowered character to where you're like min-maxing all these banal minutia of every single thing. Like mm-hmm. instead of an item just giving you like 10 damage, like a 10 damage up, it's like, oh, it gives a 2.35 damage multiplier, but it subtracts 0.08 from your speed and then your shot speed is also mm-hmm. decreased by the difference between your uh shot height and like the amount of money you it's just like it's it's just doing like calculus. Yep. And yeah, the great players can like manipulate everything to to win. Like Sinvicta has like a thousand wins in a row. Mm-hmm. It is so Fiddly. It became a game that was just like this random awesomeness is going to happen to turning into like I'm counting like, granules of, of sugar for a recipe. Like it's just too much. And the reason for that is they made the game multiplayer. Up to four yeah. people can play couch co-op. And so they increased the difficulty and they thinned out the usefulness of the items. Because you're expected to have four players putting damage on the enemy, right? Well, there's a big problem with that. One, it requires so much knowledge to even get into the game. You're not going to find freaking three other people to sit down and play it with you. It's just not going to happen. And you can't play online. Mm-hmm. So you're just screwed. And it's then just, It's not a co-op game. <laughs> it's just not a co-op game. It's just not. No. It's It's too hard to do that. And... Like there, like when you beat a boss, it'll drop four items, right? One item for every person. Well, sometimes it'll drop a terrible item that, like, there are items in the game that will ruin your run. It'll drop mm-hmm. a terrible item that no one can pick up, and the items are not presented simultaneously. They're one after another, so it's like, here's item one. Who's going to take it? Oh, really? Right. They don't all drop at the same time? No. Joe will take oh, item one, and then item two is like bored. an item that's going to ruin the game for everybody. So you're forced you to take, take like it, so a, then there is no item three. You know, the little, the it's a decapitation head thing that yep. everybody hates, and yep. all the items so, that like, people it's, despise. It's so. such a miserable thing. So I've, I've discovered the best way to play it mm. is to hook up four freaking controllers and play four-player co-op by yourself and take all of the items on one character and it feels like it used to be. <laughs> okay. But you're like cheat. Like that's like cheating, right? Yeah. I did a video about it. And I was like getting revenge on the binding of Isaac. I streamed it several <laughs> times and it was a disaster. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to get revenge on it. I'm going to put all the items on one character. And even then it just mm. feels like a worse version of what it used to be. That's so annoying. I'm mm-hmm. so mad. That was my do- desert island game. Like if you could have any item you took on a desert yep. island, what would it be? I was like binding of Isaac. Pure comfort game. Anytime I didn't know what to play, like I said, thousands of hours, I played it just and like over, over and over. Millions of fun broken runs, and then, yeah. So I, I there, there was a point where the Binding of Isaac was in the top ten most streamed games on Twitch. Like it was competing with like Fortnite and Minecraft and crap, mm-hmm. and like they just shot themselves in the foot. And they told the developer, like, why did you make the game so anti-player? Like, you made it not fun for the player. You already have their money. It's not Mm -hmm. an online competitive game. People Mm -hmm. love to watch people play The Binding of Isaac and just talk like we're doing right now. It's like watching a podcast with a game going on in the background. And they just ruined it. Because the people that used to talk and have really funny things, like Northern Line would talk about, like, these anecdotes. I went to the grocery store and this woman, like, threw up on the peaches. You know, like, all this crazy stuff. (laughs) Because you could just enjoy the game. Now it's so nitpicky and fiddly. Mm-hmm. You have to focus squarely on the game. There's no opportunity to talk about that. They did things, all right, so they made the characters 20% slower, and then they made the bullet shots from the enemies 50% faster, just across the board. Mm-hmm. Why? Oh, it's way harder. Why do I, that? I 
So I feel like after birth, there were a million like game breaks in it. You could yeah. break the shop. You could break this. You could do that. You could do that. And there were a lot of ways that if you were a smart player, you could overpower the game. And I feel like the developer like didn't like that. He was like, oh, my game's too easy. People can break my game too, too easy. And I feel like he took it just way too far trying to make it harder. Like he, it was like he had a chip on his shoulder or something. He's like, oh, I'll show you like, you know, and one of the beauties of the game is, uh, you know, w the end game for that game is Eden runs. Basically, that's 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 the end game is there's this character called Eden. In case you guys aren't familiar and what it is, is every time you start a new round, Eden spawns with two random um, uh, items Item. and has random stats. So you might have two good items, two crappy items, three health, one health. You know, you know, it can be it's random each time and you're supposed to, like, try to do uh, runs and win as many times as a row in a row as you can. And like, you know, back in the day, there were people that were, you know, I could get, I was on, you know, do like a hundred runs in a row, 150 I've gotten up to, I could do, I was, you know, could do that no problem. And now it's like, dude, I personally can't do that. And, um, it's made it like, it's, it's, it's ruined so many things about it too. So like another thing I, I hate to harp on too, is like before, like it, it had a very established path of like what, what it means to like be a run. Mm -hmm. you know, and now the way it's set up like you could go seven different directions right and beat the run and i'm just like ah i don't like it it's just not as clean it's like is it the same run if you kill hush and you do this and you do that and you don't kill the yeah, last it, boss it's it's weird I, I, I talked about that in my video that came out this morning right the hardest boss is i talked about beating mother and it's like oh you mm -hmm. have to go in a secret area that you can only access if you have like the correct consumables and in that area, you have to find a secret hidden fire to kill yourself temporarily and then find a secret hidden mirror to take mm. yourself into a hidden area inside the hidden area in which you find, go to the shop to get one half of the knife, which is the key you need. Then you mm. fight your way out of that. And then you go to an it's just that over and over and over and yeah. over and over and over and over. There's all these like loops you have to jump through. And the game, it's not just about beating it. What the game wants you to do is 100 percent percent yeah yeah find every item beat every mode of everything you can do with every single character they doubled the amount of characters and, and they, they made put, all the characters really weird and wonky it's like this evil, character doesn't dude. shoot she doesn't have she doesn't shoot instead she has a little familiar over here on the side that shoots for her and it's like okay so i can't line up my shot because the familiar is like moving around or uh, the alternate version of this character doesn't shoot at all. Instead, she shoots like a placenta out of her stomach in front of her, and then that shoots. And you're like, how do you aim your shots? It just gets so weird. But the thing that really hurts it more than anything is they doubled the amount of items. But mm -hmm. of the items they added, about half of them don't do a damn thing. They just don't do anything. It's like, mm -hmm. it lets you see where hidden rooms are. There's like a, a, a freaking... Five uh, different things that do that. There's yeah, I know there's like see -through so walls, the the item pool of the good through. items is like diluted now, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, they ruined my favorite game, dude. They ruined no. it. <laughs> I completely agree. And like not and for me, like one of the biggest things too is like I felt like it was so I don't like games that like to me are actually disrespectful of my time. They Incredibly are actually, disrespectful. actually designed to be like, oh, you want to do Eden runs? Well, that's going to take you at least a thousand hours. So yeah, you I know. Can unlock everything until you can have fun and enjoy the game. Like, yeah. holy it, shit. It wastes your time. It was the Binding of Isaac was early in the roguelite kind of renaissance and mm -hmm. it nailed a lot of things right. But later on, when Hades came out, it's Hades is objectively a better game than the Binding of Isaac. Now, it's not mm -hmm. my favorite game over the Binding of Isaac, or at least it wasn't at that time. But Hades has an important component to it that is missing from the Binding of Isaac. And that is, and these are roguelites, so you're going to fail a lot of runs and have to start over from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Hades, every single run, you earn something. You get some sort of experience towards an item. You unlock some new ability. You get an upgrade for your hub world base. There's always something. No run is wasted. When mm -hmm. Repentance came out for the Binding of Isaac, 75% of your runs, you don't get you a do damn nothing. thing. 
You just lose. You just lose an hour of your life. Down and play for like an hour and twenty minutes. Yep. You're trying to eke out a victory. You get to the boss. Hush is down, or delirium is at like five percent, and you get telefragged and you die. And it's like, well, I got nothing for it. Just like that was the only hour I had to play for the next two days, and you get it's you get rage. Looking for this one. My (laughs) such bull crap, man. Why do that to us? My girlfriend literally was like. Honey, I think you should take a break from Isaac. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because she could just tell. I'd just be sitting over there like. I am so mad at it. I am you so, having I fun? I'm like, yes. finished, I finished Mother and Dad. So the two alternate paths on all the characters. Nice. So now all I have to do is go through and beat like the old content. But then mm. even after that, I still have a few challenges I have to do. And I have to unlock every freaking item in the game. And some of them I- are like. Get a get a certain uh NPC to pay out ten times with a freaking thing. Like I've I've a uh, five thousand times I've used it. I've never gotten them to pay out once. So in like two thousand hours of gameplay, I haven't gotten them to pay out once, and I have to have them do it ten times to unlock one of the freaking items in the game. God, that crap's so irritating. It's mm-hmm. so irritating. It's so anti-player, and I hate that. It's, yeah, there's, it's, it's, I don't know where, World of Warcraft did the same thing when they introduced uh, achievements. Like, they just, like, there's certain games, they just started putting things in games where they're, like, like, abusing their own players. They're like, hey, we're going to put this thing in there that the only way you can do this is it takes 3,000 hours. Like, there's yeah. no, like, that's just how it is. If you want to do this, it's 3,000 hours. And, like, when you do that, like, that is a messed up thing to do to somebody. Like, if you really think about it, what you're doing, like, you're. It really is. You're taking someone and you're actually wasting their life. <laughs> you are, you are. And it's and designed for these like not streamers in a healthy that way. play an hour every day. Like, mm-hmm. you know, Simvicta puts up a Bonnie of Isaac video every day for like eight years. Mm-hmm. Um, Lars Fest I'm, is the guy I was trying to think of, by the way. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking Cobalt out. Street. Cobalt Street's awesome. Um, Lars Fest, if you guys, if he still streams, I don't know if he does. I think he occasionally does. He's a really cool dude. He's just a chill dude. He's like one of those people like I love Isaac, but I would watch him play fucking Parcheesi, dude. He's just yeah. like one of those people like wicked cool dude. So I highly recommend his We channel. got some things in the chat. We have that the mm-hmm. podcast is so much better without Figsy, but don't tell him I said that. <laughs> I wasn't going to highlight that, but and that's his best friend, Andy, by the way. So he's allowed to okay. say that. <laughs> All right. We will tell him. <laughs> we have greetings from Amsterdam. Always a late stream. It's late for me. It's like 11 o'clock. That's okay. You completed yeah. the quarry. That's in my backlog to play. I have not played it, but I love super massive games. And mm-hmm. I loved until dawn i talked about it in a video i recorded today i want yeah, to get the quarry and curse I'm, of the dead gods just came in from limited run games i ordered that and it came in i think the day before yesterday so it's going to be in the backlog too i might get to it in the next 15 years i might not we'll see yep you uh you're in the same boat as i am but i gotta say like uh again you're tasting games and it's just straight up like all the same stuff that i'm into man so I just got the I just got Curse of the Dead Dog, uh, Curse of the Dead Gods a couple of days ago too. <laughs> so like, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty on point. Um, I'm pretty excited about the Until Dawn remake coming up for the PS5. Actually, I'm, uh, I, I, I guess I knew they were doing that. I guess I saw it somewhere and forgot all about it. But I'm gonna play yeah, the crap out of that. I loved it. They're gonna do a um, graphic enhancements, and they did say they're gonna add some sort of gameplay to it. So um, okay. I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, I love that game. Um, I also really love uh, Russia Blood on PSVR one. I don't know if you played it. That's on- my yeah. second favorite so VR good. game of all time. I loved Russia Blood. I had a great yeah. time with that freaking roller coaster akimbo mm-hmm. shooting. Like, what's not to love? I did yeah, not right. find it to be scary. I found it to be kind of like almost no. like a haunted house at a fair or I'm, something. What they're yeah. going for. I loved it. I loved it. The only VR game I've ever played that's better than that is just Astrobot. Astrobot VR or whatever it is. Rescue it's Mission. Super fun. Yeah. Yeah, I really like Astrobot. Uh I really like um um the hell's wrong with me? Uh the mouse game. What the hell's wrong with me? Oh, uh Moss. Moss. Yeah. So I'm like, it's not mouse. Yeah, I liked oh. Moss too. It was uh yeah. It was fun. It felt like you were like looking into a diorama and it was kind of a puzzle yeah, game. I did enjoy Moss. 
Um, I played a whole bunch of freaking VR games mm-hmm. a few years ago. I haven't touched one since I've been in my new house, I don't think. Um, but for a while there, they were in their own like category in my backlog. So like every fifth game I was playing a VR game, and I went through a whole bunch of weird freaking crap that was <laughs> bizarre. I I played Doom VR and I've never gotten motion sickness in my life, and it gave me like the mo- rock and motion sickness, like really bad motion sickness. And the controls in that game suck. It was so bad. Well, I, it was doing the one where like you teleport around and it's like you can Correct. turn this off and just run like a normal freaking mm-hmm. third per- first person shooter. Don't do that. Don't yeah. no 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 I was like running and I ran through a door and it opened and the game like went framey and my brain thought my body was moving forward and the oh, my dude, eyes yeah. were desynced and it literally almost caused me to have a seizure. <laughs> like no joke. I was like, don't ever do that. There's a reason yep. they have like this snap movement. Your brain cannot handle it. I was uh, on my PSVR two. I was having some issues with my uh, with the tracking when I was playing Beat Saber, and it would like do that same thing where like all of a sudden it would like lose tracking and like demorph, mm-hmm. and everything would go weird and go and all and it it messes with you hardcore. Like your brain. He goes, what is happening? Like it can't, it can't process what's happening. And you like, you said it's like vertigo. Like, like I, I had to like to throw the helmet off. Cause I was like, yeah. Oh my God, this is going to make me sick. What the heck? It, it really screws with you when that all gets Yeah, it really does. Thing. I'm a yeah. neuroscientist. I know about the mechanics of it. It does not like it. <laughs> Let me tr- trust me when I say this. And that's a pretty fast. Do not take off the snap movement on VR. Do not do it. It's like rewiring your brain. It's like when you put on glasses and your mm-hmm. brain learns to adjust to them when you take them off. Using VR is doing the same thing to your brain. So when you do something bizarre like that, it's like getting LASIK on your eyes when you don't need it. All of a sudden, your brain doesn't know how to handle it. <laughs> so yeah, I don't want to go too off topic but my neuroscience and stuff. But yeah, you can trick your mind into doing all sorts of stuff. Like I love like those like 3D illusions that make you trick your mind or like... Yeah. You were seeing the rubber hand experiment. I'm sure. Yeah. You know, where like you, the guy puts your hands hands out and then there's one rubber and they like rub his hand on the other side of the thing. Yes. Hit the other hand with a hammer. Yeah. 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 And it like, like literally like you, you can show it. Like what they do is like, they take the real hand and the fake hand and they're touching them at the same Mm -hmm. time. And the guy can like swears you can feel it. And then like they stop touching the real hand. And they only touch the rubber hand. And the guy's like, I can still feel that. I'm like, that's so yeah crazy like you literally can trick your mind into like experiencing something you know i know but it's 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 yeah it's pretty wild stuff man that's pretty cool so let me get it straight you're a neuroscientist you're a crazy guitarist you're amazing guitar what i mean what else man you anything else you like to know about are you like an assassin or anything no (laughs) I i do i do a little bit of woodworking a little bit of carpentry and yeah, oh yeah, I like to I like to read like novels the, and like the whittle. <laughs> I like to whittle. I'm not a great carver, but uh, what kind of books do you like? What kind of novels? I like books too. Uh, my favorite there novel is probably. My over here. I like, you know, Dostoevsky. I read Crime and Punishment oh, several times, and okay. uh, I used to read a lot more than I do now. I have to read so much at work that I'm kind of like burned out on it at home. And if I try to like lie in bed and read, I will flip and pass out. Pass out. I'll make it like three minutes. I'll wake up with a a book like lying on my chest. But when I was younger, people are like, how do you know so much? Why are you so good at so much stuff? Why, why do you do so much stuff? The truth is my dad was older when I was born and it was just me and him and he was really sick. So I had to like take care of him when I was younger and I couldn't really leave the house too much. Like I go out and play with my friends for a little bit, but I had to be pretty close at home. So I just sat inside like playing guitar and reading and playing video games. And I just read a whole freaking bunch of crap. I read like a couple of encyclopedias. I read these like practical guides on how like clocks work and gears and Mm -hmm. how engines are fabricated and how to navigate by the stars and all that stuff. And I just had a knack for remembering that stuff. So my, I guess my internal knowledge is a little bit higher than uh, maybe some other people from a similar background to mine. But, uh, yeah, I just I've I've always enjoyed learning a lot and learning to do things. So I I'm I'm a jack of all trades and a master of few. So 
that's don't do that's exactly how i feel like i like to dabble in everything but i'm not like the i'm not a master like i'm i'm a i'm a great bassist but i'm not Les claypool and i'm a decent guitarist but i'm not Ingve. yeah and, uh, you know like i can sing but i'm not you know the guy from dream theater or whatever you know i can do i can do some stuff but um i like to dabble but i'm like also just very like self-interested and i like learning like i enjoy learning new things and i think there's a lot of people that they are the opposite they're like nope brain off thank you me yeah, watch, I, me I watch sports it. and me drinky beer yeah i like <laughs> watching sports and drinky beer a lot too uh but yeah. there are certain people that have like a desire to learn and it, it's it's like nourishing for them and I joke about this a lot. So I feel like I coined this term, but there might be a, I might've stolen it from somewhere 20 years ago, <laughs> but I remember I was going on a lot of dates and I would take these people out to these, these restaurants and like a, not like a nice restaurant. Like I worked all week to pay for this dinner and the girl would order like a chicken Caesar salad, like hold the dressing or dressing on the side or she would just order chicken fingers or whatever. So I started calling it chicken finger mouth, mm. the inability to appreciate sophisticated food. All you eat are like chicken fingers. Mm. And so many people have that and they don't have a strong diet of different foods. Well, you can get into that. You can get chicken finger mouth with anything in life. Mm. If you don't have a strong diet of music and all you listen to is like Taylor Swift and Ed Sheeran. And then you hear dream theater. And John Petrucci's over there like shredding on the guitar and there's a keyboard solo. It's going to be weird to you. It's going to be like not food because you don't have a diet mm -hmm. of, of good music. It's the same thing with knowledge. Some people have like, they've not acquired the taste for sophisticated thought. They want to have a diet of intelligence that consists of chicken fingers, right? They want to think simple things. They talk about what their friends are doing. And so, and so got these new clothes and things like that. And that is mentally stimulating to them. Just like eating chicken fingers is nourishing to your body. It fills you up, mm -hmm. but it's not the same kind of nourishment you need. If you're used to that other kind of thought process or that other sort of diet. And so I've Got always you. had like kind of a, a sophisticated mm -hmm. palate of learning. And I know not everybody's that way. And I wish I could say like, I'm going to make you be really interested in Russian literature and we're going to learn about hey, the double you know, amphibians. Great. Like we're going to learn all this stuff. People just, they don't care. They don't, cause it, why? That's mm -hmm. like, do you want to eat lutefisk? Do you want to eat salmon roe on a blueberry muffin? I'm kind of like, let's try it. But most people don't want to do it. They don't want to try it. Like that's mm -hmm. repulsive to them. Just like learning about, how a gear shift works in a manual transmission. I th so what a fascinating analogy because I I've described it too. It's like I like how you say it's like a taste, like a diet. Because I've tried to describe like when people like when I because I'm really into really heavy music, and I'm like I didn't start off loving brutal crazy death metal like like at all. Like I remember the first time I heard uh, Carcass was the first time I'd heard someone screaming. Yeah, and I was like, why is this man? Why is there a demon in this band screaming? That's scary. I was literally like, this is scary. I'm like, that sounds like a monster. I was like, what the heck? Like my palate didn't like, like I was like, Ugh, spit it out. You know what I mean? Because I just was like, what is this? But then after a while. Like, I'm like, OK, I like the taste of this. Yeah, you I acquire like a taste it. for it. I, I And I enjoy it. And now the way I explain it is like really good death metal. That's like top shelf whiskey and like regular music is like bud light yeah and like i can drink bud light all day but it's not going to give me the taste of what i need that high-end whiskey right yes like i need i want to listen to you know like you said between the barrier to me diabolical masquerade opeth some crazy technical high level you know i look and i'm like how long is this song 11 minutes let's go yeah let's go <laughs> like, that's yeah. What, you know like but you need to develop that and, you, and after a while that's all you crave it's like you become someone who's like no i want the next crazy thing you know i don't know you, you, you do, have an you do. For it. i have i was like that 
like I pushed the boundaries of like how complicated can this music get? You you go so far down like the wormhole of like heavy metal that you're listening to bands that like put out their albums as like a freaking power file. <laughs> like yeah. it's, it's not mm -hmm. even like in a format that exists. And it uh eventually you come back around where you start liking simple music. You can appreciate it again. Uh, a good mm -hmm. example of this would be um, let's say you like hamburgers, right? Your whole life you've eaten hamburgers and you're like, mm -hmm. well, I'm going to try having Heinz 57 on this instead of barbecue sauce. And then you add a little bit more. Let's add pineapple. Let's start adding, let's have a bison burger. It gets crazier and crazier. You get into this cuisine where you're having this really exotic stuff. We're putting squid ink in the mm -hmm. buns. And instead of sesame seeds, it's puffed quinoa and all this sort of stuff. But there's only so far you can go. Right. Eventually you get to the point where it becomes like too much. You start craving simplicity. I feel like sushi is like that. The mm -hmm. complexity of sushi is in the execution of its simplicity. And sometimes just listening to like an Iron Maiden song <laughs> can be like a good old cheeseburger. Sometimes mm -hmm. listening to an Ed Sheeran song for me, even though I don't really like Ed Sheeran. It's like eating sushi. It's not the flavors I want, but I appreciate the production of it. I sure. appreciate the timbre of his boy voice. I appreciate the tasteful way in which the producer auto-tuned his voice <laughs> and made uh -huh. it try to sound more natural rather than uh, uh, unnatural. And so I think as you get older, you start gaining an appreciation for the the complex and the simple and right now i'm into baroness which is i mean they're like a sludge man on metal band out of savannah mm -hmm. it's like appalachian folk music mixed with like mastodon and they've gotten wow. more and more like rock pop over time and i'm like it's like the good old days mixed with mm -hmm. that sophistication i like and even now I, I i've kind of heralded myself as a foodie for many years Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm like, dude, I'm just into fried chicken. <laughs> like, <laughs> so like, I, I just want, right want the best fried chicken. I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I'm like, I want to know the best '80s thrash metal band that isn't Metallica. Who is it? Is it Slayer? Is it Megadeth? Is it Testament? Are they really thrash? Who knows? You start exploring the parts of your body that mm -hmm. are already here and the the regions of your mind that are already there, and it's interpreting those and understanding those better rather than always looking for something new. Although I do listen for a lot of new stuff, but it can go, it can be fun going back to revisit that and trying to re kind of calculate how you view yourself. I, um, so I, I love, it's weird. Like I love really technical music and I love that sophisticated stuff too, but I also have like a huge passion for like really simplistic punk and stuff like that. And like old hardcore, like I like Bane a lot. I don't know if you like Bane or anything yeah. like that. They're just very simple, not that great. You know, the vocals are hmm, questionable, but like, I don't know. There's just something about that simplistic, like uh, mosh music that brings me back, like back in the day, like old Poison the Well or that simple stuff. Like I do crave like that pure, simple. Well, music. I like, I like Poison the Well. They're more complicated than a lot of hardcore, but the, the one I always goes back to that if you're a hardcore fan is Converge. They're the best. They're insane. Converge, they put out Axe to Fall, and I was listening to the song. Um, I guess it was was it Dark Horse? I guess it was Dark Horse. Mm -hmm. Real up tempo, very crazy. And it goes to this like halftime feel in the middle where he's like droning. I think he's playing like maybe an A flat on the, the guitar. He's just droning it, but it's kind of high. And he's bending it slightly out of tune. And in like any other metal song. This is where the other guitars would start harmonizing with him. <laughs> mm -hmm. But he actually just doesn't harmonize. Like he intentionally leaves out an important integral part of that song. And what's missing ends up being what the focus of the song is. Like that's the part that stood out most to me of that entire thing was how like I was expecting something and he gave mm -hmm. me something totally different and he mm -hmm. performed it in a way I wasn't expecting. So that to me can speak very loudly. And so I think there's a lot to say for like old school punk 
and old school hardcore and even new school punk and hardcore. Um, mm-hmm. There's always something to be gleaned from any sort of art that you consume in your life. And I have to say, hello, Radio to Rancid. Thank you for coming to hang out. I appreciate it. Keanu Mate says, Sounds of Perseverance by Death is legendary. Oh, yeah. Death. I classic. agree. That's great. But I think that, he, what Chris is it? Uh, or not Chris. What's up? What's up? Uh, not symbolism. What is it? Symbolism what is it has like Crystal Mountain on it. And, oh, um, uh, Leprosy. Thousand, what was it? Is it Leprosy? No, Leprosy is their first album. That was like an 88. This is a. Uh, I don't know Death that well. Oh, man. Hold, on, <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What's, what's the album? Richard Christie, thank you. Chris Christie, I said. <laughs> that fucking, that's uh, not it. <laughs> death albums. Symbolism? What is it? Freaking crap. Uh, what the hell? Symbolic. That's it. Symbolic mm. is my favorite one that they did. It was the one that they did right before The Sounds of Perseverance. <laughs> Well, I just got a shout out to the greatest musician of all time. It's actually. Oh, David there Hasselhoff. he is, man. David Hasselhoff. So as, as much as I say, I'm a man who has sophisticated tastes. Uh, maybe I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I also have a passionate love for cheesy stuff. Like no joke. I think I unironically un- like, uh, like Michael Bolton songs. <laughs> like, Dude, I listened to some Michael Bolton not that long ago. The man and it sing. was like, boy, I can sing. It's so good. It's so good. So I have I've started hearing songs recently that like I've heard a million times. Like growing up, I was like, I don't ever freaking want to hear this song ever again. And then it like pops up on the radio, and I'm like, I start actually listening to it, and I'm like, this is a bop. Like this slaps pretty freaking hard. The other one that I like heard the other day, I've never liked this song. I've always hated it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was Rick Springfield's Jesse's Girl. Come on, man. Jesse. And, uh, no, the chorus is what I think in my head. And I'm like, that's fine. But dude, I started listening to the verse at the beginning of it. Mm-hmm. Jesse's got himself a girl and I want to make her mine. That's fine. But he goes, he's like, I'm wa-, he's like, I'm watching her with my eyes. Like, I was like, I believe Rick Springfield when he's singing this. Like, this happened to him. <laughs> like, this is a true story. And I feel it now that i'm 41 years old i was like i've been through this man this hurts <laughs> tell me mm. more about it and uh it's funny how you get older that sort of thing starts happening so i uh, oh, i didn't know what 90 percent of the music i listened to man when i was a kid oh my lord yeah dude it was uh th- there's so many of those like the the big one that hits hard now when you listen to it is you start getting older and more nostalgic about days gone freaking listen to some bob seeger <laughs> and you're like oh god dude i can't like i can't even live with myself i was like he's just telling the story of all the crap that happened to me when i was 18 and the terrible mm-hmm. mistakes i've made that saying like uh i wish i didn't know now what i didn't know then i was like you can't say that dude it wounds too much <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah sometimes that stuff can hit really hard really home um so Let's talk about your channel a little bit, just in case there's some people here. Um, how long have you been doing YouTube for? I mean, I mean, it's relatively new, right? Like a year and a half or so. Wow, man. And you're closing in on 10K subs, right? You're like real close, right? Yeah, I'm about 300 away. Oh, 200 maybe. That? Well, if anybody's listening right now, please go over and sub to RNG Gamer right now and get this man to 10K. He deserves it. And he's going to make it. And I'm looking forward to hearing when you're on the 50K front because you're doing fantastic. So. I hope so, man. I'm, I'm hoping so. I hope I can get there. So I like I I'll say before like he does quality content looks great great editing um your information's fantastic your attitude's fantastic and like I said like I don't know I I watch a lot of people in the gaming scene and I know a lot of people and I've seen a lot of collections and like I said you have good taste and you like you, it's like really solid stuff guys so you'll enjoy his content if you're into collecting for sure cuz it spans everything uh, i'm so jealous of the amount of space you have for that beautiful collection too oh thank um, you thank you this is a it's a good size room this wall behind mm-hmm. me is probably uh 14 or 16 feet away and then it goes about 40 feet that way that's insane dude there's a couple things you had that obviously caught my attention so i love that you have the actual original flash version of isaac like oh yeah 
that's awesome um i thought that was really fascinating too you had like these games like there was like a company that you said that was like doing like uh monthly indie games and they were sending when they went out of business oh or something yeah like indie that. box they were out before limited run games this is like we're talking 2000 mm. 10 2011 2012 and they were doing physical releases of pc games they're right let me see here let me get the camera we can do this right there mm -hmm. there's a bunch yep. of them right here and they would put out like physical versions of their games and they would make like custom usb flash cards for the the physical release put a lot of feelies in there but it was like a monthly subscription like you would do uh with like hello fresh or something like that they would yeah. just send you a game every month and you paid for it whether you wanted the game or not which i think was kind of a maybe a bad business play for them but i guess they were just afraid of people not buying the games but they put out a bunch of crap like they put out a physical version of hollow knight like yeah. seven years before anybody else did it was where the stanley parable came out originally like yep. the stanley parable released with them physically before it was released on steam so, so cool it was really cool and i really liked that service a lot um but they they did this ploy with uh gamestop where they were going to try to sell their it wasn't their full collector's edition boxes it was mm -hmm. like just a basically a uh like a dvd case maybe or a steel box Mm -hmm. uh, of their releases at GameStop and like nobody bought them. I remember going into my GameStop and they had like all their games for five bucks a piece physically. And they sat there for months and months and months and months. I wish I had bought them, but mm -hmm. I already had all the games and I, I subscribed to them for a few years, two, two and a half years or something like that. Definitely and, sounds uh, like they were just a little ahead of their time. They were just sure. a little ahead of their time. And I miss that a lot. I really do miss that service. I wish it had come back. Uh, I remember when they were shutting down, they did like a clearance and you could go on there and buy whatever you wanted. They just opened it up and they had Torchfall 2. Uh, is it Torchfall with the Diablo clone or whatever? Torchlight. Torchlight. Torchlight yeah. 2. They were like the first ones to put that out. And I was like, I want to get that. And I ordered a copy of it. And they sent me an entire case, like 32 copies of it. And I messaged them, <laughs> and was like, do you want it back? And they're like, don't even worry about it. We shut down the warehouse. Just enjoy. Thank you for being a good member. Wow. And uh, I was like, okay. I just gave them out to all my friends and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I really liked that service. I miss it a lot. I like physical PC stuff. I know it's hard to get it running, but I like having mm -hmm. it on the shelf because I had so much of it when I was younger. And mm -hmm. I just love the way it looks. So I missed that. Yeah, I um, I was blown away because, like I said, I couldn't believe like the Hollow Knight was in there, Stanley Parable, and another game that blew me away was Nuclear Throne was in there. Yep. And I have been, oh man, that got announced by Limited Run like freaking years ago. That was on there, like upcoming games. We're gonna do Nuclear Throne, and it, it never came out. Never came out. And I remember years. I was checking on it, checking on it, checking on it, checking on it. Never came out. So. I was pretty, uh, I was like shocked when I saw that you had a physical copy of that's the only like, one. Oh man, I didn't even know that existed. That's I should it, get yep. that. That is so cool, man. Um, I feel like we don't get a lot of love for old PC on this, but I, I do like old PC gaming quite a bit. Yeah. Um, uh, one of your videos that I saw you were talking about, I saw that you bought the big boxes for Warcraft 2. Yeah, and uh, was it didn't recently. go so great. It looked like there were some problems yeah, with it. I got uh, ripped off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> I, uh, so I've just wanted like Warcraft two in the green box, uh, or the blue box and it's expansion in the green box. Cause I had them when I was a kid and I threw the big boxes out like an idiot. Same. And there's also this battle net edition, battle like in a foil right. cover and that foil net edition. I see it, that foil battle net edition. I see listed for like 200 bucks. Hello, Cyrus. It's nice to have you here. Um, all the time. So I was like, there's this post and it's all three of them for like $200 or right at it. Mm. And I was like, I'll be getting the battle net edition and the other two will be free. So I ordered, it comes in the freaking dude had cut the UPC out of the bottom of the battle net edition. So it had and a it giant just, hole in it. So happy he forgot to take a picture of that it side. Of so the happy he forgot to take a picture of that. Mm. And 
the inside box, like the cardboard that keeps the whole unit rigid, mm -hmm. missing, just gone <laughs> on all of them. Well, I would and just throw that away. The truth Why is, I didn't even. Box I didn't. Not the inside. Well, I didn't actually even open up the box. He shipped it to me in for like mm -hmm. two weeks. I set it inside my door. So I was like, I'm gonna do a pickups video, and it might be kind of yeah. cool to unbox it on camera. And then I was like, ah, that's dumb. I don't want to do an unboxing. That, that's not my brand. So I like opened it up and looked in. I was like, they look good. I'm like I shut it, stacked a bunch of crap on it. Mm -hmm. And then when I was like going to film the video, I picked it up and I was like, why does this box only weigh like nine ounces? <laughs> like what? What is wrong with it? And I pulled it out, and by then it was too late to fight with eBay. I didn't open the the report or anything. So mm -hmm. it turns out that that battle net edition, while it is listed often at like 200 bucks, it really sells for about 40 or 50 complete. So yeah. I paid about 180 or 90 for something that should have been really like, I don't know, 120 or so. I, I find deals occasionally, but I'm fine paying retail usually, but I don't like getting ripped off. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first time I got ripped off in a long time. That's you know, a lot of the times, you know, on eBay or whatever you're buying, if you some see something that the deal just seems too good to be true, it is because I mean I've had a similar thing happen, like uh, just not paying close enough attention. Like there was uh the um plastic anniversary controllers. You've seen these before, the PS4 ones that are no dude, I've never I've never seen one in my okay. entire life. <laughs> Do you notice anything anything weird about mine? It's fake. Yeah. The Can bottom I... black, yeah, yeah, dude. So, like, I bought this, it was like you know, wicked cheap, and I was just hastily, I'm like, oh, it's a great deal for that, man. I'll buy that, blah blah blah. I get it in, freaking look. I'm like, oh, you son of a bitch, <laughs> I was so mad. <laughs> but, like I said, I, I got it for like 20 bucks or something, okay. And so, I just I called the dude and I complained, and he gave me like 10 bucks off, so I got this for 10 bucks. That's so not like, too bad. So I'm like, you know what? This will be my player two one. So I actually yeah. have, I have a, like a nicer one somewhere, <laughs> like a real one. And then I had, this was my spare or whatever, but yeah, you know, people just, you know, and of course there were no, there were no pictures of the back of the controller. It was just the front. And I of was course, just yeah. to notice that these things were black because I'm dumb. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I bought the 20th anniversary controller or whatever it was when it was brand new. And it's been my like main PS4 controller ever since. It. And people are like, you use it? I was like, yeah, dude, I freaking use it. I do. Of course I use it. I do. I, I play my stuff. I'm more of a gamer than I am a collector. So I, I, I have am no too. problem doing that. I am too. And I can kind of tell in a way just from your collection because you don't, um, you're not a full set person for the most part. You got a Vectrex set and stuff on it. But I'm like, and, you, and you might be going for one throughout time, but like you seem to focus on the games you want from each system more than completing sets for each yeah, system. Yeah, I don't whatever. I don't really have any aspirations of finishing a set unless it's like a an event of opportunity, right? I, I just want to get the games I want to play. But occasionally I'll do something like with the Vectrex, I really liked the Vectrex mm -hmm. and I was looking for a couple of games I couldn't find and I found like a killer deal on eBay where I bought a big lot and it had a bunch of games in it. And I looked and I was like, I'm only three away from finishing the set. I looked at what those games were. And I was like, I'll, I'll, I'd like to play those. So I went ahead and finished it off. The mm -hmm. same thing happened with the Virtual Boy set. Like mm -hmm. a buddy of mine was trying to sell off his complete in box water world. And I was like, I, I'll help him out. And I picked it up. And then I was like, well, now you really only need Jack Bros. Yeah. yeah I was like, now I only need Jack Bros and a couple of other ones. So I, I knew a guy that had a copy of Jack Bros and I picked it up off of him and I was like, I'll finish it off. But I don't really have any aspirations of finishing off any other sets. Like I'm kind of close on the Atari Jaguar, but I'm, I don't even have a list of like what I'm missing. Mm -hmm. but yeah. I just buy the games I want to play or that look interesting. What's the Neo Geo? You almost done that one? Uh, I have a lot of Neo Geo stuff, but <laughs> I'm know. not, not close <laughs> to being complete. <laughs> Nobody completes that set anymore. I know say. a guy that has a complete sealed Neo Geo AES set. Sealed? Sealed. Oh, my God. Like, see, he's got Metal Slug sealed. Like, oh, my Lord. Yeah, he has Metal Slug X sealed. He has all the stuff. He has Shamur Samurai Showdown special, the last game to come out sealed, oh. with the certificate that they sent from Neo Geo thanking him for his support. Um, He rad, also man. has a complete sealed NES case set so they shipped nes games in the boxes mm -hmm. of six 
right? He has a complete yeah. set of everything in the original boxes in the so games inside copies. are all sealed. He has six copies of sealed of stadium events. Can't though. Yeah. Can he come on the show? <laughs> he's fam- he's a famous YouTuber. I don't I'm know if sure I can get him is. on the show. He's it's he's incognito good. at the moment, but it's all good, dude. You could you could if you do if you type in game room tour on YouTube, you will find his content up at the top. Yeah, I, um, I can believe it. I'm assuming he's supposed to be pretty well known. But uh, yeah, he's he's like legendary. He, he's like the kind of guy that will buy out an entire arcade in another country because he needs like the steering wheel from a rare arcade machine, and then he'll ship okay. it halfway across the world to get the steering wheel. Yeah, yeah. That, that kind of that kind of money. I don't have that kind of money. <laughs> no. no. And even if I did, I wouldn't be doing stuff like that. I just want to play. I just want to play. And I just want to share what I'm playing with everybody else. That's all I want to do. So if I had a lot, like in no money, I would pretty much have the same collection I have, maybe like with another dozen really expensive games. And then I would have another room full of guitars. That's that's what would have had. I really would have. You know, you say that. I I would have another room full of gear. (laughs) I have a a room or I had a room full of guitars and amps. Mm -hmm. And I had like amps in storage and Mm -hmm. like, and we had the new baby and my guitar room became my wife's office because her old office turned into the nursery. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm clearing out a bunch of like guitar gear. Like I've sold several mm-hmm. amps and I'm selling my old cabs right now. I yeah. have about these are six cabs. of boogie cabs that I'm Lord. getting rid of. And I actually made a chart of all the guitars that I still have. I have about like 15 of them sitting around here and mm-hmm. I'm just going to have someone take the chart and blindfold me and hand me the guitar and I'm going to play it. And I'm going to say like what I like about the sound, what I don't like about the sound, what I like the feel, what I don't like about the feel. And then I'm going to rank everything and everything that falls below a certain threshold. I'm going to sell it. I don't care if it's a 68 Les Paul. Oh, you'd be surprised what you actually like. He might be like the cheapest guitar you own. You never I've know. got one over here that I bought here. I'll show it to you real quick. Mm-hmm. I feel like most people who have really spe- expensive guitars, like they'll always have like their daily driver, like this little like cheaper one that they like just something about it. They just love like I used to have this old Washburn that I just loved it. I don't know what it was about it. I just love the fretboard. I love the feel. Just felt good. So I just preferred playing that. I don't know. What you got there? Oh, it looks beautiful. This is just like a bog standard like Gibson mm-hmm. ES-335. Like the one you can get off the shelf for like four grand. Mm-hmm. And I thought I would hate it. I thought I would hate it. But I ended mm-hmm. up loving this guitar, man. I think it's like great. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's real cool. It's got the, it's the beautiful. quilted flame on it. But normally I'm like, I don't want an ES-335 unless it's like a vintage. Like if it's under 20 grand, don't even bother, man. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, dude. That's This is what I mean about uh, if I had all the money in the world, this is what would happen. Because guitars are expensive like you know nice ones you know like even cheap ones are like two three grand if you really want a decent one so yeah you can get cheap stuff now uh Mm -hmm. when i was a kid you couldn't get a decent guitar for under a thousand bucks 700 Mm -hmm. bucks something like that but i have kids that i teach now and they come in with like a squire and i play it i'm like it's not that bad it's for like 200 bucks i'll say this the best guitar i ever played in my life that felt the best was a Texas special squire telecaster hmm. and I played it at a guitar store and it was sitting, just sitting there. I was just noodling around on it. I was like, this guitar feels great. I love this guitar. Is it for sale? And they're like, it's not for sale. Like I brought that in for repair. We just repaired it. We were just demoing it. We love it. We can't stop playing. It. I was like, well, he sell it. And they're like, he won't sell it. Like the guitar store owner offered him like a thousand bucks for like a $300 guitar. He wouldn't take it. And I was like, I'll give him 1500 bucks for it. And they're like, we'll give mm-hmm. him a call. And he wouldn't take it. Mm-hmm. It was just like, like, no, he just wouldn't take it. That was his guitar, man. Um, but yeah, I have dude, like I got a stack of them over there on the floor, just like Gibson's and fenders and Ibanez's and mm-hmm. Paul Reed Smith's just stacked up. I got to get rid of some of them. Yeah. I probably. find, I find there's more enjoyment in the simplicity and the limitations. So I think having some limitations would be good for me. I have too many guitars, man. It's it's frustrating when you sit down and you want to play and you're like, well, I got to change the strings on it. And you like change the strings mm-hmm. on the guitar. And then you're like, 
All right, what amp am I going to use? It's like, oh, let's use the freaking, let's use the triple rectifier. And you like plug it in. You're like, oh God, the tubes need to be biased. And then like, all right, well, I'll try mm -hmm. out the Hughes and Kettner. And then it, it, you spend 40 minutes of your one hour, you have a practice time, like tinkering with knobs. Which pedals am I going to use? I'm like, let's just, the, the happiest I ever was was when I owned one guitar and one amp. Let's just mm -hmm. try to get back towards that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty much what I want to get down to too. Like I have, um, this is like a really nice vintage Trace Elliott bass cab. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's freaking amazing. I've had it since I was like 15 and I just like, I hate to get rid of it, but it's like, I just, not, I haven't been sitting in the closet for like five years. I'm not doing nothing with it. I'm not yeah. doing any bands. It's just, and it's, it's almost makes me sad because somebody out there could be making music with it and enjoying it and actually giving it some life. So I know, yeah. I know. Well, I mean, when your possessions start becoming a burden, then like it's time to let them go. Right. Agreed. Yeah. So, uh, so what's, uh, anything big news coming up on the channel? Anything else we got to keep an eye on? You're working on any new projects, any new videos we should keep an eye on for? Yeah. My videos come out every single Saturday, <laughs> come hell or every high Saturday. water, 8 a, 8 a.m. Central Standard Time. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did one today that was the hardest video game bosses. Next week is going to be a harebrained nonsense video I'm doing. I got tagged by Samantha Zira, who has another great YouTube channel, mm -hmm. um, to do games. Five games under $10, which really isn't on brand with what I do, but I was like, that might be kind of fun. So I mm -hmm. mixed that with like a game hunting video. So it's like, come watch me fail at trying to find deals on games. And in the meantime, I'm going to tell you about games you can actually find for a good deal. That sounds um, fun. But the, uh, the one I'm going to do after that, I'm excited about. I had done several videos where I, like pull an Xbox 360 game off the shelf. And I was like, this is an uncommon game. It's cheap now. You should definitely pick it up because it's going to be expensive one day. And mm -hmm. wouldn't you know, I picked out four or five games that I said that would happen. And they're all over a hundred bucks now in the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. So I was like, it might be kind of cool to have like six months ago and me saying that. And then three months ago, me saying this and showing the prices and being like, now here are the next five games that will probably be expensive. I think that would be kind Smart. of a fun video. But I've got a few conventions coming up. I'm going to be at uh, Game Jam South in Huntsville, Alabama in a couple of weeks. And then about two months from now, I'm going to be at uh, the Southeast Game Exchange in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. I'll be a special guest at both of those. That's super, super cool. And I think uh, it's a great topic to focus on right now, the Xbox 360. Uh, it's uh, definitely going to go wild in the next few years. Uh, probably next few months to be honest with you so yeah if you guys are watching if you guys are interested in that you want to get some good information you should check out his channel and sub subscribe I'm, uh, i'll leave uh links in the chat for everybody too uh it's rng gamer on youtube it's twitter RNG gamer on youtube and everywhere instagram else. all the yeah. all the socials cool man. yep well uh yeah just want to say it was great for having you on there i think it's, we're gonna wrap it up it's a little bit after the two hour mark now so uh this is awesome. great man thank Hope you so much for time. having me it was a blast i'm glad yeah. we did it man we'll yeah, have to do it again fun. sometime absolutely so usually what we do is like we like to have everybody on here at least once by themselves give everyone the spotlight they deserve but then if you have friends you want to bring on you want to do a panel or something you have an idea for a show you let me know we can do it too because i like doing that too like you know if you have like five people want to come over and talk about between the barrier and me we can do that. yeah we can do that <laughs> <laughs> we'll, let's do an episode about nothing but metal or something no i'm just kidding that'd be fun but, uh, yeah dude that was a great show i had a lot of fun and i hope everybody enjoyed watching it hope you guys have a great night Thank you so much, everybody, for coming out. I appreciate it. All right, guys. Take it easy. Oh, hold on. Where is it? All right. <laughs>